Nick, thank you. And I'm sure that uh, the crowds we saw there outside Buckingham Palace tonight, uh, many people will be reflecting on the themes that uh, Nick was underlining there because everyone is by now aware that the Queen was the longest serving monarch in the history of the uh, United Kingdom and held a commanding presence in British public life over many decades. That is established clearly. And tonight, of course, people have been reacting to the news of her passing earlier today. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, uh, has spent part of the day with some of those people who've gathered outside Buckingham Palace. She was long to reign over us, almost all of her life, and for most here, all of theirs. Through the streets of London, they streamed to pay tribute to our Queen. What's your reaction to the news? Oh, I'm so sad because she was a wonderful lady. She dedicated her whole life to the nation and we could just thank her for it. And we feel for her family today. Um, it's a very sad day. I'm so sad because she was a lovely, beautiful lady. Beautiful mother and a beautiful grandmother. Could just shed many tears for her. She was very much loved. There is a real sense that this queen was a history maker. It's devastating. She's going to be missed by so many people. She affected so many lives and she was an absolutely amazing monarch. And what did she mean to you? Well, I think as, as a woman, it's amazing to see a, woman, a female at the helm of our country. And why I might not ever get the chance to see another woman as queen. Deeply saddened about, you know, the queen. Um, you know, she's done a lot for the country and it's sad to see, you know, her go and, you know, condolences to the family. What did the Queen mean to you? You know, she meant everything to, to me, my family, um, you know, a sense of community, you know, loyalty, um, you know, giving back to communities, um, serving, you know, the community as a whole. Um, so she meant a lot to, to everyone here today. What will you take away from her life? I think, you know, the biggest thing that I'll remember is, you know, her sense of sort of charity, giving back. The crowds used to gather here in their hundreds of thousands to see the Queen on the Buckingham Palace balcony. As soon as her death was announced, they came back. There is a hush here, as the one constant in the country's life is no more. In the place where she died, Balmoral, the locals were enormously proud of their regal visitor who joined them each year. Just very sad. She's been a monarch for over 70 years and it's, it's history and we just wanted to be here to share our condolences to the family. Like, just be part of it kind of thing, yeah. It's really sad news to hear, actually. It's, uh, that's the reason we came. We were hoping to pass on our regards or just to be here. So it's kind of sad, actually. Although, you know, you, don't, you, you never knew her or anything, but her significance was, was just incredible. I and mean, it doesn't really hit home, I don't think, until you hear something like this. And um, what she meant to us and what she meant to the country was an absolutely incredible legacy. At Buckingham Palace, thousands came, through the rain, through the night. No one here truthfully is sure what to do, but they know they want to be here, to stand, to mark the moment, to bring flowers, to remember. There was applause. Happy and, glorious. and the anthem, words that have echoed here, for 70 years. For us, God save Her kingdom is united in sorrow, but also in admiration, in the sense that we have been fortunate to live in her era. Through change and turmoil, there has always been the queen. Well, those crowds are still there, some people drifting away, new people arriving, walking down the mall, making their way towards Buckingham Palace. And Lucy is still there for us too, so let's join her now. Well, it started with a few hundred people at the gates and the news of the Queen's death, it seemed to spread quietly through the crowds and they stood there watching as the Union flag was lowered. And then as the evening went on, Thousands turned out, as you said, hundreds are still here. You might be able to hear they're still singing the national anthem. And it has just been very moving in its simplicity here. And I'm joined by two people, Tracy and Olivia, who uh, came 
down this evening to pay their respects. I just want to start, Tracy, by asking you, why did you want to come? Well, the Queen has been a part of my life forever. I'm in my 50s now and all my life, she's just been a part of my life. And I've been following the news all day, really, really sad and heartbreaking news. And at the last minute, 8.30 this evening, I thought I'm going to jump on the train and come down and be a part of this, what is a, just a momentous occasion. Put some flowers and a little candle and just be a part of celebrating the, Her Majesty's life. And what does it mean to you to be here? It's, well, it is a historic moment. I mean, it's a great atmosphere. As you said, it's a great atmosphere tonight. It's quite sombre, but there is a kind of air of, sort of celebration of her life as well. So I'm just so pleased that I came here to actually just experience this and be a part of it. And, and Olivia, what about you? Why did you decide to, to come down this evening? Kind of the same as Tracy, you know, even for me growing up, you know, seeing all the jubilees and the events and things like that, you know, it feels like the Queen's just always been there. Um, and I think you'd struggle to find somebody more kind of culturally and, you know, just historically significant, all the things that she's lived through, these huge kind of, you know, changes. And for it to almost feel so suddenly to come to an end, obviously, like we've been following the news all day and, you know, obviously the news of the passing was incredibly sad but it's also a real atmosphere um, my friends were here before and they said you know you've got to come you've got to you know be a part of it and as sad as it is it is a really kind of huge part of history and it's incredible to kind of just even be a small a small part of that uh, and what, what did the queen mean to you I think I think she meant a lot of things to a lot of people. Me personally, I think she was she was in a sense somebody to look up to, somebody who, despite kind of hardships and challenges, you know, whatever kind of came her way, she always seemed to be so sturdy and so steady. Um, and I think I really kind of respect that kind of steadfastness about her. Um, and I feel that's a real a real quality to to have had and to have showed to so many people. Well, thank you so much for for joining us tonight. I think tomorrow the focus will again be at Buckingham Palace as people tomorrow wake up for the first time in 70 years without the Queen on the throne. Lucy, many thanks again. Lucy Manning, our special correspondent, and thanks to your guests as well there at uh, Buckingham Palace. Now, the time is 10.38 uh, and you're watching an extended edition of BBC News at 10 on uh, the 8th of September 2022, the day that Buckingham Palace announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Her Majesty died at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. And the Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has now become King Charles III. Shortly after 6.30 this evening, Buckingham Palace released this statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. And the King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. And that statement there confirming the official news of the Queen's death was then posted outside royal palaces across the UK. Uh, this was at the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. The same uh, tradition then was observed at Buckingham Palace and other palaces as well. And then at Buckingham Palace, the uh, Official announcement there was fixed to the railings and the crowd, knowing that this was part of the tradition, were waiting for that to be posted. It's the way that the royal household announces news in the traditional way um, before the days of social media. Uh, and that, again, is the formal recognition of the news of the Queen's death. That was uh, at Buckingham Palace uh, early this evening. Uh, and clearly there's a lot of focus on the response in the nations of the UK, of course, uh, in Northern Ireland and in Wales uh, and in Scotland, especially where Balmoral has been such a, a prominent feature of royal life uh, over the years. And the BBC's Sarah Smith is at uh, Holyrood for us. And uh, uh, Sarah, maybe some more thoughts on you, from you on the impact of the news of the Queen's death in that Scottish context. Well, the Queen held a very special place in many Scottish hearts, 
because she so obviously loved Scotland. And being here um, just last year addressing the Scottish Parliament, she talked of her deep and abiding affection for this wonderful country, as she called it. And because of the amount of time that she spent in Scotland and her clear enjoyment of it, the Scots felt very close to the Queen. She came and visited them here very often. You had the First Minister Nicola Sturgeon tonight talking about how the people of Scotland loved, admired and respected the Queen. You've been talking during this programme about where as a nation we go from here after the passing of Queen Elizabeth. And that's a question that will be felt quite acutely in Scotland, where, as you know, there is continuing debate about whether Scotland ought to become an independent country. And it's without doubt that the Queen was part of the glue that held the nations of the United Kingdom together. So without her, we'll wait to see how that debate might take a different direction, but undoubtedly people who will be unsettled by the passing of the Queen will be wondering what kind of political impact it's going to have as we ask ourselves questions about what kind of United Kingdom we are now and whether in fact we should remain united. The um, SNP always said when the Queen was on the throne that if Scotland were to become independent she would remain the monarch, that she would still be Queen of Scots as well as Queen of the rest of the United Kingdom. Under King Charles III the debate may take a different turn and that's something that people here will be waiting to see. Indeed, Sarah, many thanks. Uh, Sarah Smith there for us at uh, Holyrood. Um, and, uh, of course, response as well from the First Minister of Wales earlier today, Mark Drakeford, uh, who expressed his sympathy uh, on behalf of the people of Wales. Let's talk to our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith. Uh, Howell, how would you describe the general response there today? Well, I'm here at the Senate here when a few people have already come to lay flowers. The flags have been lowered to half-mast and all official business has been suspended for a period of mourning. This is a place that the Queen came to know well, particularly in recent decades. It was where she made her final visit to Wales back in October last year for the sixth opening of the Senate. And she was seen then for almost the first time using a walking stick in public. So it became very clear to people from then on that she was becoming more frail. It's an institution, some people argue, that she lent legitimacy to. She was actually part of the first National Assembly's opening in 1999. We're told, despite some official advice from Whitehall, that she shouldn't really be part of the devolution project. But she was involved and what people here have been telling me is that she was happy to see change and wanted to be part of it rather than to stand against it. As you mentioned, the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, uh, has uh, added his condolences, talking about the Queen as a person of dedication and selfless devotion. All those many organisations for which she was patron in Wales, all the sporting organisations, the agricultural ones, she would be seen sometimes at the Royal Welsh Show. So lots of people wanting to express uh, their sympathy to the family as we enter now this long period of mourning. Howell, many thanks. Howell Griffith there for us at the Senedd in uh, Cardiff Bay. In Northern Ireland, of course, a part of the UK that's known its uh, share of terrible troubles and uh, the tension in the political process still very much in evidence. Um, so this period of uncertainty, uh, which certainly applies to Northern Ireland, now obviously um, will be taking in the changes around uh, the monarchy as well. And Emma Vardy is at Stormont for us. Uh, Emma, how would you describe the response there today? Hugh, there's been very moving tributes here across the poli political spectrum. And of course, the Queen visited Northern Ireland many times in times of peace but also during the 30 years of conflict known as the Troubles here. And what really stands out about the Queen's relationship with the island of Ireland is the role that she played in peace building and in reconciliation. Now, of course, the big political dividing line between communities here is over the very sovereignty of Northern Ireland itself. So, of course, the Queen is seen differently by unionist and by nationalist communities. But after the Good Friday Agreement largely ended the violence here in 1998, the Queen's visits here became hugely important 
for the British and Irish relationship. And that's very much been reflected in the tributes from political leaders today. We heard from the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. He said that Her Majesty reached out the hand of friendship to help with the reconciliation process. And Michelle O'Neill, the vice president of Sinn Féin too, she said she was personally grateful for the Queen's contribution in building relationships with those of us who are Irish. So the Queen will certainly be remembered here with affection and with respect across the political divide. Emma, thank you too for joining us and uh, for giving us a sense of the response there in Northern Ireland. Emma Vardy at Stormont. Well, Queen Elizabeth came to the throne at the uh, age of 25, came to the throne in rather sudden and abrupt circumstances when her father died at a relatively young age. And during her long reign, she witnessed momentous social and economic change in Britain uh, and indeed throughout the Commonwealth. Her Majesty's death concludes a major chapter of British history, uh, a chapter that opened at the midpoint of the 20th century as Britain emerged from the years of the Second World War. My colleague Nicholas Witchell presents this account of the Queen's long life. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted Queen. Your Majesty willing to take the oath? She was 27 when she took the coronation oath. I solemnly promise so to do. She was anointed, Will blessed, and consecrated. She took possession of a 1200 year old throne. She knew that it was a role from which only death could release her. And yet, when she was born, no one had thought that it would be her destiny. Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born on the 21st of April, 1926. She was the first child of the then King's second son, the Duke of York. This was the young Princess Elizabeth at the age of four, visiting a photographic studio in London. Her life then was comparatively carefree. It was the abdication in 1936 of her uncle, King Edward VIII, that unexpectedly placed Elizabeth in direct line to the throne. Her father became king. His coronation gave the then 11-year-old Elizabeth a foretaste of what lay in store for her. The family unit was strong. Her father, George VI, was devoted to her and she to him. Throughout her life, he was to be her inspiration. During the Second World War, as German bombs fell on Britain, the royal family symbolised the country's fight against tyranny. Elizabeth briefly joined up. She was taught how to drive and to service an army lorry. On the night Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace and Elizabeth joined her family on the palace balcony. By now she was a young woman and she'd fallen in love. Her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten was announced in July 1947. Four months later they were married in Westminster Abbey. Again and again the people called for Elizabeth and Philip. Again and again they joyfully responded. A year later, their first child, Charles, was born. Two years after that, a daughter, Anne. The king had been in poor health. He'd been treated for lung cancer. When Elizabeth left for a visit to East Africa in February 1952, it was to be the last time she would see him. The flag is low as the news spreads. The king is dead. At the moment of her father's death from a heart attack, Elizabeth was in a game park in Kenya. The news that she was now queen was given to her by her husband. Her tour of the Commonwealth cancelled. The princess we knew as a girl and watched in the even growth of her stature comes back to meet her ministers as queen. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young 
and so it was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. Britain was stunned at the loss of its wartime king. His coffin was brought by train from Sandringham to London. Elizabeth was there to receive it with her mother and sister. And now here comes Her Majesty. Elizabeth's coronation in June 1953 was one of the biggest public celebrations in Britain's recent history. For the first time, television cameras were allowed into Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to millions. The moment of the Queen's crowning is come. As Elizabeth was crowned, she accepted what, to her, was a sacred duty, an obligation to serve, which was to set her apart for the remainder of her life. Elizabeth was sovereign and head of state, not just of the United Kingdom, but of Britain's realms and territories in every continent. Sydney siders turn out to greet their queen. In late 1953, she set off on the first of many overseas tours, with a six-month trip to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. This is a joyous, spine-tingling welcome. The young queen was a star on the world stage, and her popularity was never greater. It's estimated that, in Australia, three-quarters of the country's entire population turned out to see her in person. But as the 1950s gave way to the swinging 60s of the Beatles, attitudes started to change. Old certainties were questioned. The monarchy was seen by some to be stuffy and out of touch. By the late 60s, the palace realised that it needed to take the initiative. The result was a groundbreaking television documentary. The film Royal Family showed the monarchy as it had never been seen before. Elizabeth was shown performing the daily business of the sovereign. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? And meeting visiting dignitaries. The American ambassador, Your Majesty. Oh, why fit on there? Save the But the film also showed something of the private Elizabeth, relaxing with her family on a picnic at Balmoral. The salad is ready. Good. Her silver jubilee was celebrated with street parties and pageants in 1977. Good evening, Your Majesty. You've had a very long, yes. long day. Didn't By you? the 1980s, Britain had its first woman Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Relations between female head of state and female head of government were sometimes said to have been strained. With this ring, with this ring, I thee wed. I thee wed. For the Queen and her family, the 1980s had begun with a moment of great promise. Prince Charles's wedding in July 1981 to the young lady Diana Spencer seemed to be a moment of hope for the future. When the marriage began to fail, its decline was a very public one. The couple's separation was announced in 1992. It followed the collapse of the marriages of Princess Anne and Prince Andrew. To compound the misery that year, the Queen had seen part of her favourite home, Windsor Castle, destroyed by fire. She was devastated. The fire seemed to symbolise the reversal of the royal family's fortunes. Little wonder that in a speech the Queen described 1992 as her annus horribilis, her horrible year. But worse was to follow. The death of the by now divorced Diana, Princess of Wales, in a car crash in Paris in August 1997 was to provoke what, for the Queen, was a shocking backlash against the monarchy. She'd remained at Balmoral with Princes William and Harry after Diana died. Her priority had been to care for her grandsons. But to the grieving crowds outside Buckingham Palace and elsewhere, it seemed as though the royal family simply didn't care. The Queen returned to Buckingham Palace and, in an unprecedented live broadcast on the eve of Diana's funeral, she tried to heal the breach that had opened between the palace and the people. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. 
The Queen promised to learn the lessons from Diana's life and the reaction to her death. The whole episode had shaken her. For the first time, she'd appeared to be out of tune with the feelings of her people. With Charles's marriage to his long-term companion, Camilla Parker Bowles, in April 2005, the royal family was finally able to turn the page on the domestic anguish of previous decades. It was time to move on. For the Queen, it was a moment of relief. And in the years that followed, with scarcely any lessening of her workload, she appeared to enjoy her role with renewed enthusiasm. In 2011, she was at Westminster Abbey for the wedding of her grandson, Prince William, to Catherine Middleton. It was a moment when the public's appreciation for the monarchy seemed to be reconfirmed. A few weeks later, at the age of 85, the Queen made one of the most important foreign visits of her reign when she became the first British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland. She laid a wreath in memory of those Irish nationalists who'd risen up against the Crown and, at a state dinner in Dublin Castle, she spoke with regret about Britain's treatment of Ireland. With the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we would wish had been done differently, or not at all. The following year in Belfast, she met and shook hands with Martin McGuinness, a former leader of the IRA who by then was Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. It was another significant gesture of reconciliation. Her Diamond Jubilee in 2012 confirmed the nation's regard for a monarch who'd reigned for 60 years. Mr. Bond, Your Majesty. It was also the year when the Queen showed that she too could spring a surprise. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Sovereign and secret agent, one of the highlights of the opening night of the London Olympics. By the time of her 90th birthday in April 2016, she'd become the United Kingdom's longest reigning monarch, its oldest, and few would disagree, one of its most deeply respected. She continued with her public duties well into her 90s. There was further family turmoil, though. Prince Andrew was forced to withdraw from public life amid claims he'd sexually assaulted a 17-year-old, claims he denied. And then the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, decided that they wanted to step back from royal life. They moved to California and gave a television interview in which Meghan made damaging criticisms of the royal family. They were unsettling moments, presided over by a monarch who showed that her sense of commitment was undiminished. Together we are tackling this disease. During the coronavirus emergency of 2020, she broadcast a reassuring message to the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Her words seemed to encapsulate her role as monarch, drawing on her own long experience to help settle the nation at a moment of difficulty. Her resilience was evident again in April 2021, when her beloved husband Philip died two months short of his 100th birthday. They'd been married for 73 years. At Philip's funeral at St George's Chapel within Windsor Castle, she seemed a solitary figure, pausing at one point to turn and look back. The figure who'd been two paces behind her for so many years was now absent. Elizabeth had lost the husband who'd meant so much to her. But despite the great sadness of her loss, there was never any question of her withdrawing from the path of duty. She marked the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne, a record no other monarch had achieved, in February 2022. By then it was apparent that she was rather more frail physically than before, though mentally as sharp as ever. 
Her doctors had advised her to take things a little easier. Light duties was the expression used by the palace, but every day there were red boxes full of official papers to deal with. In a message to mark her 70 years on the throne, she said she was humbled by the loyalty and affection she'd received throughout her reign. And she signed the statement, Your Servant, Elizabeth R. By June 2022 and the public celebration of her Platinum Jubilee, her declining health limited the events she could attend. There was, however, a delightful surprise. A pre-recorded appearance, a somewhat chaotic tea party with Paddington Bear. Um, perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you for everything. That's very kind. This was a monarch at peace and enjoying herself. On the final day of the Jubilee celebrations, there was a final appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. The national anthem was sung. A much-loved monarch acknowledged the many thousands who'd waited to greet her. The crowds cheered and cheered, but finally it was time to go. The Queen turned to depart from the balcony on which she'd first been seen as a baby. There was an unspoken feeling that an era was drawing to a close. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth II embodied the strengths of a constitutional monarch, a constant and reassuring presence at the centre of our national life. For decade after decade, she represented a changing kingdom to itself and to the world. Above all, hers was a life guided by Christian faith and driven by a profound sense of duty and by the pledge she made to the world on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. life story like uh, no other really beautifully done Nick if I may say so um, such a lovely tribute and really to just encompass lots of different facets of the Queen's personality and life 
um, which came over very strongly in that uh, film that you put together. And I think for lots of people watching at home, um, a very powerful and moving reminder of what the Queen has represented in people's lives. Yes. Even at times <clears throat> when the royal family's not been playing a prominent role for whatever reason in certain events, jubilees and all the rest of it. Just a reminder of the personality and the power of the Queen over the last 70 plus years. We won't see her like again, Hugh. I think we can say that. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's, it is hard to imagine Britain without her. And, you know, we were talking about it earlier, weren't we? The key to this, I think, is humility. She recognised that as a hereditary monarch who was there just by virtue of her birth, she had to earn the respect and the trust of her people. And she referred to it on the night of her coronation in a broadcast on the BBC. She said, throughout all of my life and with all of my heart, I shall strive to be worthy of your service. Mm. We saw how she signed that message at yes. the time of the 70th anniversary of her accession, your servant, mm. Elizabeth R. As a former Archbishop of Canterbury, Donald Coggan said, it has been service untiringly done and duty faithfully fulfilled. I think there'll be millions watching who will say amen to all of that. Nick, thanks very much. Uh, of course, the Queen was not just the monarch for the UK. She was the head of state in 14 other Commonwealth nations. And our diplomatic correspondent, James Landill, has been looking at the international response to today's news. From the moment the Queen's reign began in Kenya in 1952, she played a constant and significant role on the international stage. And today there was an outpouring of sorrow and regret in every corner of the globe. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so. The President of France, Emmanuel Macron, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth embodied the continuity and unity of the British nation for over 70 years. I keep the memory of a friend of France, a Queen of Hearts, who marked her country and her century forever. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. And the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said it is with deep sadness that we learned of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. On behalf of the Ukrainian people, we extend sincere condolences to the royal family, the entire United Kingdom and the Commonwealth over this irreparable loss. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who met the Queen in more peaceful times, offered his condolences, saying she'd enjoyed the love and respect of her subjects and authority on the world stage. She was dubbed by one of her biographers as Queen of the World, visiting hundreds of countries throughout her reign. She was monarch of 15 separate realms, the head of a commonwealth of some 56 nations. So there was no surprise that news of the Queen's death made headlines around the world. Königin Elisabeth II is tot. Das teilte der Buckingham Palast in London mit. Tonight at the White House, the flags were at half-mast. Throughout her reign, the Queen was a living embodiment of the transatlantic relationship, meeting no fewer than 12 US presidents. In a statement, President Biden described her as a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy. Barack Obama said she had reigned with grace, elegance and a tireless work ethic. Views echoed on the streets of Washington. I admire her greatly. Yeah, I'm so sorry that she's passed. I mean, she's an icon here, everywhere. Horrible. I've been reading about her my whole life. She's one of the sane people in the UK. 
like the U.S. And that's just sad. As head of the Commonwealth throughout her reign, the Queen nurtured and shaped a unique international organization whose leaders, past and present, relied on her wisdom and judgment. The last days of the Queen's life captures who she was in so many ways, working till the very end on behalf of the people she loved. And that is why I'm sure that we will receive the news of her passing with both emotions of deep sadness but also gratitude for a life that was utterly and completely devoted to the service of others. And it was to a meeting of Commonwealth leaders that the Queen made her last overseas tour in 2015, visiting Malta, an island she'd once called home, the bookend of a life of duty and diplomacy on the international stage. James Landell, BBC News. Let's explore the uh, international response then a little more. In a moment, I'll be talking to my colleague uh, Katya Adler, our Europe editor in Brussels. First, let's go to Washington and our North America correspondent, John Sudworth. Uh, we heard James there, uh, John, talking about the embodiment of the transatlantic alliance. Is that the kind of stature and importance that people are attaching to this news today? I think it is, Hugh. Uh, first off, the flag is flying at half-staff here at the White House in honour of a reign that has seen the swearing-in of 13 US presidents. The Queen met 12 of them personally, and the last in that long line, Joe Biden, of course, is currently at the British Embassy here in Washington, a couple of miles away from where I am, where he has signed a book of condolence and made a few brief remarks. And in an earlier statement, uh, he spoke of how in his meetings with the Queen she had cheered him and the First Lady with her wit and moved them with her kindness. I think in recent years, of course, like so, ma so many other parts of the world, news coverage of the British monarchy has been driven often by the, uh, by the scandal and the intrigue. But there is no doubt today in the rolling news coverage of events at Balmoral that there is a real sense of a moment in history. Don't forget, Hugh, that the last King of America, George III, was a direct relation of Elizabeth II. But hers was an era, of course, defined by that special relationship between two independent democratic nations, and she often referenced it. In 1961, she said to President Kennedy that free people all over the world looked to America as a place of aspiration and hope. John, many thanks. John Sudworth there with some thoughts for us at the White House. And let's uh, go then to Brussels and talk to Katya, who's there for us. Katya Adler, our Europe editor. Of course, the UK's relationship with uh, Europe and more particularly the European Union has uh, changed dramatically in recent years, Katya. So how would you describe the response today to the Queen's death, given that the relationship, as I say, uh, between the UK and other countries has well, let's just say it's not the same as it was. Well, when it comes to the Queen, I think you cannot overstate uh, the respect and admiration that so many Europeans feel for her. Here outside the European Commission, flags are flying at half-mast as outside the European Parliament as well. Over in Paris, the Eiffel Tower has been plunged into darkness as a sign of respect. And if you go on any European news website uh, tonight, you Die Königin, La Reina, La Reine, news of her death is on the front page. If you look at Norway's public broadcaster, they've totally stopped normal programming to concentrate on the Queen. And of course, we've heard from leaders, from heads of state, the German president describing the Queen as a woman who shaped a century, Emmanuel Macron saying a kind-hearted Queen who left a long-lasting impression. Previously, he described her as a golden thread binding France and the UK since World War II. And of course, because of her decades of public duty and family ties, she had very close relationships with the royal families of Europe as well. And very unusually for them, we've been hearing very personal, very touching messages. If you look at uh, the King of Spain, King Felipe, he used to refer to her as dear Aunt Lilibet. And tonight he said he would miss her dearly. And here in Belgium, the King and Queen said all of their encounters and would be etched on their memories forever. Your Majesty, rest in peace, they said, alongside your beloved husband. Katya, thank you very much. Katya Adler with thoughts for us there in uh, Brussels.
Let's take a look then in uh, some more detail, if we can, at what's going on outside Buckingham Palace right now. This late at night, it's uh, quarter past 11, and there are still lots of people there. Uh, lots of people have determined to stay there to show their sympathy for the royal family, to express their own sadness at the news, and uh, people are still milling around at this late hour uh, in central London. Uh, clearly, Buckingham Palace, the main focus of people's expressions of sympathy uh, there. But uh, the notices, of course, the formal notices uh, of the Queen's death were also posted on other royal palaces, uh, including Holyrood House and uh, Balmoral, and of course at Windsor as well, and elsewhere, uh, Sandringham too. So that's the scene at Buckingham Palace. And while we look at these images, it's worth reminding ourselves that Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister, one of those who was paying tribute uh, to the Queen today, in a, an eloquent uh, tribute by him, uh, he called her a bright and shining light that has finally gone out. Uh, and the First Ministers of Wales and Scotland, as we said earlier, have been paying their respects, uh, honouring the Queen's sense of duty and her resilience. So our political correspondent, uh, Leila Nathu, uh, reflects now on the words expressed today. Flags being lowered to half-mast at Downing Street this evening. Tonight, former residents paid tribute to the Queen, who'd asked them to form a government. The example, the duty the selflessness, the way in which other people were put first, the way in which we hand, she handled crises with great stoicism when they occurred, as they occurred a number of times during her reign. They were all examples to people about how to behave in their own lives and examples for our country. Her longest serving Prime Minister, Sir Tony Blair, said, we have lost not just our monarch, but the matriarch of our nation, the figure who more than any other brought our country together kept us in touch with our better nature, personified everything which makes us proud to be British. Gordon Brown took over the Labour government in 2007. He reflected tonight on the impression the Queen made around the world. Everywhere I went, Her Majesty was respected, she was admired, she was revered, and we will miss her greatly. There is no monarch who has served so long with such popularity and held in such high esteem and dedicated ourselves so much to the future of our country. David Cameron returned the Conservatives to power in 2010. He said of the Queen, there can be no finer example of dignified public duty and unstinting service, saying we all owe our sincere gratitude for her continued devotion. I was fortunate to have been able to call on the knowledge of the world's greatest public servant and indeed the world's most experienced diplomat. In 2016, the Queen appointed Theresa May as Britain's second female Prime Minister. I was fortunate enough to be able to meet her in different circumstances, including in the weekly audiences, uh, uh, but also at, at Balmoral and saw a more relaxed uh, Queen. But I think we are all mourning the fact that somebody who was a constant in our lives has now passed away. It was just days ago that the Queen accepted the resignation of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. Tonight, he said, we think of her deep wisdom and historic understanding and her seemingly inexhaustible but understated sense of duty. This is our country's saddest day because she had a unique and simple power to make us happy. That is why we loved her. There was a sombre mood among politicians in Westminster and around the country. The Queen was an ever fixed mark in our lives. The world changed around us, politicians came and went. The Queen was our nation's constant. The Queen represented duty and courage, as well as warmth and compassion. The Queen was a living reminder of our collective past, of our greatest generation and the sacrifices made for our freedom today. Scotland loved, respected and admired her. And by all accounts, Her Majesty was really happier than when she was here in Scotland at her beloved Balmoral, a fact I have been privileged to observe personally. I hope it will be a source of comfort to her family that she spent her final days in a place that she loved so much. On behalf of the Welsh Government, 
and people in all parts of Wales, I offer our deepest condolences to all Her Majesty's children and their families on this sad occasion. She will be sorely missed by the many organisations in Wales she championed and supported over so many decades as patron or as president. MPs have been accustomed to the Queen setting out government priorities in Parliament. Tomorrow, they will begin paying their tributes in the Commons. Leila Nathu, BBC News. Well, faith leaders uh, have been probably in the, among the most uh, prominent of those today who've been paying tribute to the Queen's work. The Queen, of course, a, uh, uh, a person who drew a lot of strength from her Christian faith. We've had the Cardinal of Westminster um, for the Roman Catholic Church paying his tribute earlier. We had the Chief Rabbi. Um, we had the uh, Muslim Council of Great Britain. Uh, and, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, who paid his own tribute to Justin Welby, um, to the Queen's kindness and a sense of great duty and the values, the Christian values that she put into practice in terms of dealing with others and considering problems which uh, people shared. Um, our religion editor, Ali Makbul, uh, joins us now from Lambeth Palace, which is the Archbishop of Canterbury's official London residence. Um, and Ali, such a strong link, obviously, for titular reasons, for official reasons, between the Queen and the established church, the Church of England. Uh, absolutely right. As well as being head of state, of course, she was defender of the faith, supreme governor of the Church of England as well. But by all accounts, as you were alluding to there, uh, those were titles uh, that uh, the Queen considered more than constitutional duties. They were things that she lived by. We heard that in the statement given by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who alluded to the fact that her faith really guided her, uh, in his words, hour by hour, hour day by day. And of course, uh, Justin Welby talked about his profound sadness uh, at the news, but also the great privilege it had been to meet the Queen on many occasions, uh, talking about, uh, as others have, of course, about her humility, her humour, her kindness, and saying uh, that uh, she had been a great blessing to us all. But the Queen, uh, certainly in the latter parts of her reign, had uh, been very clear that she felt that Anglicanism uh, had a duty to protect uh, people of other faiths, uh, to be able to practice other faiths, and that's uh, reflected in the huge number of messages, uh, as you were saying, that have come from other faith groups. Pope Francis also has sent uh, a telegram to the King offering his condolences. Now, we hear that uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury is due to meet the King uh, tomorrow, and the Church of England has also called for churches across the country uh, at midday to toll their bells for a full hour in respect. Ali, thank you. Ali Makbul, our religion editor at Lambeth Palace, which is the uh, official residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury. As we approach the end of this uh, broadcast, uh, it seems appropriate that uh, we can just uh, remind ourselves of a very happy episode in June of this year uh, when the United Kingdom celebrated the Platinum Jubilee, 70 years of uh, Her Majesty's reign. And that, of course, a landmark that no other British monarch has, has reached. Um, and it was four days of uh, great celebration and happiness, and the Queen made some memorable appearances there. Our royal correspondent, Sarah Campbell, reminds us now of those rather wonderful four days. The sun shone and crowds filled the mouth. For four days in June, the message could not have been clearer. God save the Queen! Jungle, we're and A galaxy of rock royalty and the British people in their thousands celebrating a reign etched so deeply in our memories. Your Majesty, Mummy, <laughs> you have been there for us for these 70 years. These pictures on your house are the story of your life and ours. And listen to the reaction of this 
delighted and grateful crowd. The Queen's appearances were brief but unforgettable. Oh, that's wonderful. On the first day, her delight both at the sight and sound of so many people and the antics of her great-grandson were obvious. That evening, Her Majesty lit the first of a giant chain of beacons, symbols of hope in two and a half thousand towns and cities from Shetland to Australia and New Zealand. What a wonderful sound, those bells. It can be heard all over the city of London. The next morning, the bells of St Paul's marked the national service of Thanksgiving, the surrounding pavements packed with well-wishers. We'll never see this again in our lifetime, so it's, it's really a special day for us, yeah. Absolutely magical atmosphere. We're enjoying every second. This was the largest gathering of royals since before the pandemic. Almost all the members of her family were there, but not the Queen. She was unable to attend in person, but watched the service from home. Thank you for showing us how service and faithfulness matter. This is English champagne, especially for the Queen. The thank yous continued at tens of thousands of Jubilee lunches, bringing communities together, something the Queen had done throughout her reign. We talk about it love, love, love. We talk about it love. At the platinum party at the palace, a lineup of legends. each with their own memory of Britain's longest reign. And I've grown up with this woman. You know, I was seven when, when she came to the throne. So she's always been part of my life. Around the Olympics, yeah. she was absolutely essential. When some of the selection panel come through the city, she hosted them at Buckingham Palace on a Friday night and even appeared on the balcony and waved them goodbye. So it, it sort of put Paris and Madrid in its place. Yes. <laughs> I do hope you're having a lovely jubilee. To those memories, she added... Tea? Two more. Oh, yes, please. Stealing the show with Paddington. A wave from Her Majesty to acknowledge the wave of love that is surely coming across that balcony and sweeping its way through the palace. And bringing events to a close on the balcony of Buckingham Palace, surrounded by her family including her three heirs. A wonderful four-day party was officially over. But what a platinum jubilee it had been. Wasn't that uh, lady right in the crowd when she said, we just know this is such a special event and we're never going to see anything like this again. And she just struck exactly the right note. It was a, a lovely four days. Uh, Nicholas Witchell is still with me. A last word, Nick, before we uh, end this broadcast. Um, I don't like to ask the question, but I'm bound to ask the question for reasons of um, curiosity for people watching. Certainly, what happens now in the next few days? Celebrations three months ago, now mourning, a period of national mourning and millions of people will mourn and they will feel that mourning very personally and very keenly, I think, and it won't just be in this country, it will be elsewhere as well. The Crown has passed immediately, imperceptibly and visibly to Charles. He, uh, of course, no heir to the throne has waited for longer, no heir to the throne has been older on succeeding to the throne and it is now to him as the personification of the crown that all the main organs of the state owe their allegiance, the armed forces, the judiciary, the courts, the civil service, the government. He will address the nation at some point. There will be a meeting of the accession council when the reign of Charles III will be proclaimed. He is king, there is no swearing in, there's nothing like that necessary. Bells will be rung and guns will be sounded in tribute to Queen Elizabeth. There will be church services and condolence books will be opened. 
and flowers will be laid, and I suspect on a scale that we will not have witnessed since the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. And then in approximately 10 days from now, we will get all the details from the palace uh, in due course, but in approximately 10 days, there will be the state funeral. And of course, we haven't seen a state funeral in this country since the state funeral of Winston Churchill in 1965. And then the, the king, and the nation will have a chance to pay their final respects to the monarch who signed herself your servant, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Nick, again, thank you. And we will talk surely in the days ahead. But thank you for your contributions today as we reflect on the long life and reign of Elizabeth II. Nicholas Witchell, our royal correspondent, coming to the end of this uh, momentous day, a significant milestone, we can all agree, in the history of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. Uh, the longest serving monarch in history, no longer with us. Uh, her eldest son is already king. It's a day that few in Britain will forget for as long as they live. There will be continuing coverage now from my colleague uh, Christian Fraser, but we will leave you tonight with some of the great images, those powerful and moving images from the Queen's life. So from all of the team here, thank you for being with us and good night. It is our dearest hope that the Queen will be happy and our resolve unswerving that our reign shall be as glorious as her devoted subjects can help us to make it. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and the commanding presence in British public life over a span of eight decades. She died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become King Charles III. It was a half past six this evening that Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Following the death of his mother, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. 
The death of my beloved mother, he said, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. Queen Elizabeth came to the throne at the age of 25, and during her long reign she witnessed momentous social and economic change in Britain and throughout the Commonwealth. Her Majesty's death concludes a major chapter of British history, a chapter that opened at the midpoint of the 20th century as Britain emerged from the years of the Second World War. Nicholas Witchell presents this account of the Queen's long life. No British monarch lived longer or reigned for a greater span of years. Few presided over a period of greater change and very few brought quite such a level of dedication to the role. Elizabeth was born on the 21st of April 1926, the elder daughter of the then Duke of York. No one could have imagined then that she would one day be queen, but when she was 10 years old, her uncle, King Edward VIII, abandoned the throne and her father became King George VI. German bombers rain fire and high explosive bombs in almost... During the Second World War, as German bombs fell on Britain, the royal family, Princess Elizabeth as she was then, her younger sister Margaret, and their parents, the King and Queen, came to symbolise the nation's fight against tyranny. Elizabeth briefly joined up. She was taught how to drive and service an army lorry. On the night Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace and Elizabeth joined her family on the palace balcony. In anybody's life, engagement day is a red letter day. By now she was a young woman and she'd fallen in love. Her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten was announced in July 1947. Four months later, they were married in Westminster Abbey. A year later, their first child, Charles, was born. Two years after that, a daughter, Anne. But the king was in poor health. He'd been treated for lung cancer. When Elizabeth left for a visit to East Africa in February 1952, it was to be the last time she would see him. At the moment of her father's death from a heart attack, Elizabeth was in a game park in Kenya. She returned to London as queen. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young and so it was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. Elizabeth's coronation took place in June 1953 and for the first time television cameras were allowed into Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to millions. The moment of the Queen's crowning is come. Elizabeth was sovereign and head of state, not just of the United Kingdom, but of Britain's realms and territories in every continent. The Queen is greeted by the Governor General. She was to become the most travelled monarch in British history. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. It's estimated that on that first visit to Australia, three quarters of the country's entire population turned out to see her. By the 1960s, social attitudes were changing. There was less deference. The monarchy was thought by some to be out of touch. The response, a groundbreaking television documentary. The film, Royal Family, showed the Queen working. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? Oh. I fit on there. Save your and relaxing with her family. The salad is ready. Good. 
With this ring. With this ring. I thee wed. I thee wed. The 1980s began with a moment of great promise. The marriage of Prince Charles to the young Diana Spencer at St. Paul's Cathedral. By the early 90s, so much had turned to dust. Charles and Diana separated in 1992. The marriages of Princess Anne and Prince Andrew had already collapsed. And at the end of that year, the Queen watched as her favourite home, Windsor Castle, was seriously damaged by fire. Worse was to follow. In August 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car accident in Paris. The Queen had remained at Balmoral to care for William and Harry, but to grieving crowds outside Buckingham Palace, it seemed as though the royal family didn't care. The Queen returned to London, and in a live broadcast, she tried to heal the breach. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. The Commonwealth was a cause close to her heart. She visited most of its members. But it was a visit to Dublin in 2011, which was one of the most significant of her reign. She was the first British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland. She spoke about Britain's regrets. We can all see things which we would wish had been done differently or not at all. The following year in Belfast, she met and shook hands with Martin McGuinness, a former leader of the IRA who by then was Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. It was another significant gesture of reconciliation. A diamond jubilee in 2012 confirmed the nation's deep respect and affection for a monarch who'd reigned for 60 years. Mr. Bond, your Majesty. It was also the year when the Queen showed that she too could spring a surprise. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Sovereign and secret agent, one of the highlights of the opening night of the London Olympics. She continued with her public duties well into her 90s. There was further family turmoil, though. Prince Andrew was forced to withdraw from public life amid claims he'd sexually assaulted a 17-year-old, claims he denied. And then the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, decided that they wanted to step back from royal life. They moved to California and gave a television interview in which Meghan made damaging criticisms of the royal family. They were unsettling moments, presided over by a monarch who showed that her sense of commitment was undiminished. Together we are tackling this disease. During the coronavirus emergency of 2020, she broadcast a reassuring message to the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. The death in April 2021 of her beloved husband, Philip, after 73 years of marriage, was a moment of deep sadness. It was born with the stoicism that she so often personified. There was never any question of her withdrawing from the path of duty. By the time of her platinum jubilee in 2022, it was apparent that her health was deteriorating. But there was still room for a surprise, a chaotic tea party with Paddington Bear. Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you everything. That's very kind. This was a monarch at peace and enjoying herself. On the final day of the Jubilee celebrations, there was a final appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. A much-loved monarch acknowledged the many thousands who'd waited to see her until, finally, it was time to go. There was an unspoken feeling that an era was drawing to a close.
For decade after decade, Elizabeth II was the constant and reassuring presence at the centre of national life. Respected as a constitutional monarch, admired within Britain, the Commonwealth and beyond. It was a life sustained by faith and driven by duty and by the pledge she'd made on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Nicholas Witcher looking back on the extraordinary life of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, thousands of people, of course, through the day uh, gathering at Buckingham Palace and have been gathering since news of the Queen's condition broke this morning. Let's speak to Kasia Madeira, who is at the palace for us uh, this evening. Uh, as Nicholas was saying, Kasia, uh, she was the one constant in our collective life and now she is gone. But the respect and the affection that the people felt for her, I imagine on full display there at the palace tonight. Christian, you really get a sense of that. People coming here, continuing to come here. Bear in mind, it's a quarter to midnight local time and the weather's been absolutely dreadful. It's been raining consistently throughout the day. And yet people still come. And when we were talking to security guards as we arrived here, they were saying at the height of the crowds, there are thousands of people here paying their respects, just wanting to come and peacefully pay their condolences to Her Majesty the Queen. And even now, there are still hundreds of people here, people of all ages. We spoke to some young Australians who said that they, given the Queen and her position as the head of state of Australia, they wanted to be here, they wanted to pay their respects, they wanted to just take in the atmosphere. Very quiet, very solemn. But again, a little bit earlier on, people were breaking into spontaneous singing of the national anthem, God save the king. So very much people wanting to be here and wanting to just share this moment of national grief and a moment of national change for the United Kingdom. It's a good point you made that there is there is so much change coming for so many of us. She was an ever present on our post boxes, on our coins, on our stamps. The national anthem will change. We have to get used to saying, God save the king. There is a big adjustment coming for everyone, Kasia. A big adjustment, and that's something that certainly we will be talking about through the days and, of course, weeks to come. But at the moment, when you get a sense of the people here, they just want to reflect on Queen Elizabeth. She has been such a constant in this country's life. If you think about it, generations of, we, we've known no one else. Uh, a fascinating point that I was listening to today, her reign spanned 15 prime ministers, starting with Winston Churchill, and he was born in 1874. Of course, ending with Liz Truss, who was born 101 years later. So an absolute constant through those difficult times of change and turbulence. We had, of course, the impact of COVID, and we still recall how when the Queen, when Prince Philip, who was still alive then, were vaccinated, it was something that the palace wanted the public to know, a sense that they are together with the rest of the nation. So yeah, a very much constant in that, in the changing world that we're in at the moment. And what we sense here with the people behind me is that they, they just want to reflect on Her Majesty. Mm. I, I remember a, a poll that was published not that long ago, in which 31% of British people, almost one in three British people, said they have either seen or met the Queen in real life. She's touched everyone in, in some way. It's a remarkable statistic, isn't it? And if you think about the amount of meetings and greetings and openings that she's attended, that she had attended throughout her life, it's just one of the longest serving monarchs who was consistently there throughout all of these different periods. So just think about what was happening here back in June, just outside Buckingham Palace. The, the stage had been set, the, 
the Jubilee celebrations, Diana Ross finishing the finale of the concert to celebrate the platinum, the, the, the Jubilee celebrations, the platinum Jubilee. So she has been such a constant and has touched so many people. And as you know, when, when you meet a member of the royal family, it's quite, it's quite a daunting experience. Um, I never met Her Majesty the Queen. I met Prince William and Kate. And it's, there's a lot of protocol that you do. You're not allowed to ask questions as a way to behave. They instigate the conversation, but they know everything about you. They have been briefed. And so I can only imagine all of those people who have been touched by Queen Elizabeth and what it must have meant to them, her constant duty of service, her constant presence in this nation's history. And now we look forward and ahead to a change. Indeed so. Kasia, thank you very much indeed for that. Well, the sad news of the Queen's death uh, broke in reasonably good time for the papers at 6.30 in the evening. So uh, the papers, as you would expect, entirely filled with the events of what was a tumultuous day at Balmoral. Um, Mark LaBelle is with us. You've been looking through the papers. What's notable about them, first of all, is that all the mastheads, of course, have been changed to black. Yeah, the Queen was no stranger to Britain's front pages. She's adorned them for years, but yeah, the enormity of tomorrow's front pages strikes you. Black and white mastheads, the colour missing, but respectful coverage, touching coverage. If we show you the, the, the Times front page, uh, death of the Queen, they say, and they're using a, a portrait here released by the royal family uh, with the announcement of the Queen's death. But newspapers have been planning this for a long time, and there's a wraparound on the Times, which, which we can also show you now. And this picture uh, from the Queen's coronation, uh, which we can go on to, uh, that you can see in a second, is repeated in like five or six newspapers mm. there. And that was the portrait taken by Cecil Beaton in 1953. The throne room in Buckingham Palace, the painted backdrop there depicting Westminster Abbey, the Queen wearing her coronation dress there with an auburn cross. And that's really kind of, I'd say, the, the picture of choice in tomorrow's papers. But on the back of that wraparound, they put this quote from the Queen from her Christmas broadcast in 1957. It was the first time they televised the Christmas broadcast. Uh, and it's worth reading out, Christian. She says in 1957, I cannot lead you into battle. I do not give you laws or administer justice, but I can do something else. I can give you my heart and my devotion to these old islands and to all the peoples of our brotherhood of nations. Mm. And, and that was the guiding principle of her very long reign. Right until the end. Um, and so the mirror reflects what many people are thinking, which is thank you, mm. uh, they say on their front page. They're focusing on the gratitude that we saw behind Cashier of those people coming to Buckingham Palace and on the tributes from around the world. Mm. The Telegraph also chooses the words carefully, their words carefully. Grief is the price we pay for love. Really reflecting the theme across many of the papers that it's a nation in mourning. The Financial Times kept it, have kept it very simple. They have a very elegant picture of the Queen. Mm. And the Sun, as you'd expect from the Sun, we loved you, ma'am. Uh, they're reflecting their readers, they say, who were proud of the Queen uh, with Charles's tribute. Uh, printed on the back. Interestingly, in the editorial in The Sun, saying that Britain has lost its backbone and it's the day Britain and much of the world dreaded mm. is upon us. She is gone. It reminds me a little bit of, of the quote we got from the tribute paid by Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister, um, who's clearly thought an awful lot about the tribute that he was going to pay. And he will have spent more time than most with her um, at his weekly meetings. And he said, it's only when we face the reality of the loss. We truly understand what is gone and what she meant for us. And I think there will be a sense of that in the morning, won't there, Mark? People will have gone to bed reflecting on the news, but only when you look at the arc of history that will be there in the newspapers, that change that Kasia was talking about that is coming, will people, I think, really start to understand the enormity of what has happened? Yes, it's a difficult point in, in Britain's history. You're dealing with the loss of a queen, but also the making of a king. But very clearly, the papers here are all focused at the moment, at least, on the loss of the queen. There was a very spontaneous moment, a picture we'll show you now, which many viewers probably noticed at the time of the announcement of the, of the queen's death. A rainbow appeared uh, over Windsor Great Castle. Yeah. <laughs> it also appeared over... Um, 
the Victoria Memorial, prompting some uh, picked up by the Daily Mail to say that that was Queen Elizabeth uh, with Prince Philip. Mm. So I think people are, are dealing with a whole range of emotions. Um, but of course, as you said, people will be looking forward to the making of a king. Kasia uh, touched on it, this transition that, that, that people are saying, God save the king. Parts of British life are going to change. QCs, um, senior barristers that are appointed mm. by the Lord Chamberlain are, are now known as KCs or King's Councils. So that we're going to have to adapt as a society in terms of, of the naming principles and in terms of Prince Charles, who we're going to hear from you know, in, in the next few, few hours. And no doubt he'll be speaking tomorrow. Mm. But there is so much to take in from 96 years of the Queen's life, 70 years of service, that life of service that the Times was talking about. And I think uh, when people wake up tomorrow and then they have these papers in their hands, I think they're giving them that chance mm. to really take in the enormity mm. of, of what and, has And happened. that's how it should be, because, uh, of course, there, there will be time and we will look in good time at the funeral that will come in 10 days' time and the protocol and the processions that there will be. But it's right that we pause at this moment and look back on that service. As you say, on 70 years of service, we... We live in such a fast-paced life. It's, it's, it's right that we look back and, and we reflect. And she, the Queen, it's been talked about a lot, has been the unity, the reassurance through so many uh, things. She, she does try and make statements very subtly, very quietly, whether she's dressed up in Ukrainian colours or whether she wants to express her, her feelings about the union. But when we've come to times of need, when we've had problems, when we've had strife, the Queen has been there. She has met more people than, than anybody can remember. She's known the world over. And I think just seeing the image of her throughout these newspapers uh, will move a lot of people and, and shake their memories too. Yeah. Um, there have been announcements through the day. Um, of course, there, there are implications for the running of state. Uh, parliamentary business will stop. Um, all political, sporting and comedy events have been cancelled. Um, and the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth has entered an extended period of mourning. Let's just go back for a final thought to Kasia, who's, who's at, at the palace. Do you get a sense, Kasia, I, I heard Andrew Lloyd Webber um, speaking a little earlier. He was down there to lay his flowers. Do you get the sense? I, I guess the main palaces, Windsor, which was her home, and Buckingham Palace, which was very much the office, they will become the focal points, will they, for the nation's grief? I think, Christian, you're absolutely right. We can see that already with the, with the still hundreds of people here, hundreds of people still wanting to pay their respects to read that notice that was posted earlier on today that read, and I just want to reflect these words one more time, the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. So we are expecting the King, King Charles, and Queen Consort to come to London on Friday. And they will be here at Buckingham Palace. This is, this will be, one can't imagine another place where people will not want to come to. This is the place where it's the official residence of the royal family. And even though, yes, of course, the Queen was living in Windsor Castle and it's still such a symbolic place, at the centre of London, this is the one where all the tourists come to. Buckingham Palace is the one where you can go and visit. This is the one that really, as you can see just behind me, with the still hundreds of people still milling around, still just walking around and reflecting and taking photos of that notice, that official notice that had been pinned to the palace gates. One can imagine that this will increasingly become the place where people will want to reflect and want to spend some time as this country mourns. Kesh Madeira at Buckingham Palace. Mark LaBelle also, thank you very much indeed for that. Yes, it, it must be um, a whole host of conflicting emotions for King Charles. Uh, he will be the oldest heir apparent in British history. Uh, the previous oldest person to become king was William IV in 1830, age 64. Charles, of course, 73. But while he will grieve privately, uh, he must now assert himself and begin his reign. And we will hear from him, as Cassius says, in the morning. You're watching BBC News from London. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and 
the commanding presence in British public life over a span of eight decades. She died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become King Charles III. It was at half past six this evening that Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Following the death of his mother, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. Our correspondent Daniela Ralph looks back at a momentous day. Tuesday the 6th of September, the last photographs of the Queen, 96 years old and still at work. Meeting the new Prime Minister at Balmoral, a duty she had been keen to fulfil, and one we now know was her final duty, after seven decades of public service. Around four o'clock this afternoon, a number of the Queen's family arrived at Aberdeen Airport. Her grandson, the Duke of Cambridge, was first to emerge, followed by her daughter-in-law, Sophie, the Countess of Wessex, and then her two youngest sons, Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and Andrew, the Duke of York. The Duke of Cambridge drove the family group to Balmoral to join his father and other members of the family already there with the Queen. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, arrived separately later in the evening. Here in the UK for a number of charity events, his wife Meghan did not accompany him to Scotland. At 6.30, Buckingham Palace officially announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Following tradition, the statement was attached to the palace gates by two footmen as tributes began. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. And also from the leader of the opposition. For the vast majority of us, the late Queen has been simply the Queen, the only Queen, above all else, our Queen. As we mourn her loss, we should also treasure her life, our longest serving and greatest ever monarch. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. Throughout the day, there had been growing unease about the Queen's health. In the Commons, as Keir Starmer stood up to speak, opposite him, the Prime Minister was being told of the Queen's condition. Information passed to Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader, who left her seat for a while to discuss the development, before the Speaker of the House addressed the chamber. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best, best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. Cheered by onlookers, one of the Queen's last royal engagements was in July with her daughter, Princess Anne, opening a new state-of-the-art hospice in Berkshire. But these kind of visits had become rare over the past year. As the Queen relied on her walking stick, her mobility compromised. The royal household had tried to adapt to keep her active and visible. A golf buggy at the Chelsea Flower Show helped keep the Queen comfortable. But she had become noticeably thinner and frailer. 
something that severely limited her involvement in her own Platinum Jubilee celebrations, with her family increasingly representing her. At the weekend, her son stood in at the Braemar Highland Games, always a favourite event for the Queen that she reluctantly missed. Like so much of her life, the decline in her health was played out in public. Duty may have got harder to manage physically, but mentally, even emotionally, the Queen remained engaged and working to the very end. Daniela Ralph reporting. No doubt a moment of immense national sadness. No great surprise given the Queen's age and the problems she's been having with her mobility, but no question for a lot of people around the country, a, a sense of, a personal sense of shock at the news that has broken today. Uh, Emma Simpson, our correspondent, is uh, with us. A seismic moment, Emma. Uh, a moment that so many have dreaded for so long has come. Absolutely. One politician said tonight, it is hard to imagine Britain without her. And I think that really does sum it up. It's that moment of huge loss, profound change for the country, and of course, real sadness. And as you were saying, it's no surprise given her age and her declining health, but it's still a huge shock. And I think many will find it hard to believe that she was seeing in a new PM at Balmoral just two days ago, looking frail, but smiling and on her feet. But of course, it was that news at lunchtime today that she was under medical supervision, that doctors were concerned, that really changed everything, mm. that people started fearing the worst and events moved swiftly. But how do you do begin to distill 70 years as our longest mm. serving monarch? And I mm. think it comes down to, and it's been said repeatedly this evening, she was that reassuring symbol of continuity throughout our lifetimes. And at age 96, I mean, only a sliver of the UK population will have grown out, grown up throughout, without her. And she was part of the very fabric of the nation, part of the glue in a way that binded the UK together. Mm. It's really interesting, that photograph, wasn't it? Because I, I, like you say, I, I, I think she combined, she was the monarch, but she combined the official the sovereign with the familiar, the family. We could all look at that photograph and see a grandmother, for instance. Where she, there she was with a beaming smile. Yes, with the walking stick. We know her mobility problems, but she looks so well for a woman of 96. And that perhaps is why a lot of people are finding it so difficult to deal with the news today. It is, it hasn't really sunk in yet. And of course, she was in a way the mother and grandmother of the nation and you know I think in some ways her virtues of integrity, decency and duty came to be all the more appreciated the longer she survived. I should say she's been this constant in the background of our lives and I think there is such sadness and shock tonight and of course that sorrow will be felt around the world for all the lives that she's touched and I think many Christian wished that she could have gone on forever, ever really. She symbolised the nation. And tomorrow, of course, she won't be there. A new era begins and it will be the start of a momentous week to 10 days, an era of transition. Yes, we will turn our ears to our new king, King Charles uh, III, who must lead uh, the nation through the grief and the mourning. Um, just on that note, I said to Mark, um, who was just here, that there is plenty of time to look at what comes next. But there will be in the background a lot of things, a lot of protocol that will be organised by the cabinet office, by the palace. What do we expect will come in the, in, in the foreseeable future, in the next few days? Of course, there have been very detailed, long established plans that will have been tweaked over the years and perhaps some further tweaks now given that she passed away at Balmoral. But what I think we can certainly expect is that the Queen's coffin will be taken down to London. We know she's going to be lying in state. And of course, there is the state funeral. We don't know when, but that could be in 10 days time. So events are going to unfold um, in the coming days. We know King Charles is going to return to London tomorrow. We're going to have some tributes in the Commons and it really will be a momentous week to mm. 10 days. This is a chance for us to give thanks 
to reflect. And of course, tomorrow morning, Christian, when the kids go to school, just imagine all the school assemblies that are going to be taking place. You know, we're going to be talking uh, right up and down the country about this as early as when the kids go back into school tomorrow morning. Yeah, my children asking about it tonight before I came to work. They've come to know it, as have many other young children, and uh, they're much part of this story as well. Uh, Emma, thank you very much uh, indeed. As Emma says, uh, we are, of course, will move uh, in 10 days' time towards the first full state funeral since Winston Churchill in 1965. And Britain will mourn, and many people around the world will mourn with Britain, particularly, of course, uh, the family of the Commonwealth. Boris Johnson has led tributes to the Queen from former British Prime Ministers, calling her a bright and shining light that has finally gone out. The First Ministers of Wales and Scotland have also paid their respects, honouring her deep sense of duty and her resilience. Our political correspondent, Leila Nathu, reflects on their words. Flags being lowered to half-mast at Downing Street this evening. Tonight, former residents paid tribute to the Queen who'd asked them to form a government. The example, the duty, the selflessness, the way in which other people were put first, the way in which we hand, she handled crisis with great stoicism when they occurred, as they occurred a number of times during her reign. They were all examples to people about how to behave in their own lives and examples for our country. Her longest serving Prime Minister, Sir Tony Blair, said, we have lost not just our monarch, but the matriarch of our nation, the figure who more than any other brought our country together, kept us in touch with our better nature, personified everything which makes us proud to be British. Gordon Brown took over the Labour government in 2007. He reflected tonight on the impression the Queen made around the world. Everywhere I went, Her Majesty was respected, she was admired, she was revered and we will miss her greatly. There is no monarch who has served so long with such popularity and held in such high esteem and dedicated ourselves so much to the future of our country. David Cameron returned the Conservatives to power in 2010. He said of the Queen, there can be no finer example of dignified public duty and unstinting service, saying we all owe our sincere gratitude for her continued devotion. I was fortunate to have been able to call on the knowledge of the world's greatest public servant and indeed the world's most experienced diplomat. In 2016, the Queen appointed Theresa May as Britain's second female Prime Minister. I was fortunate enough to be able to meet her in different circumstances, including in the weekly audiences, uh, uh, but also at, at Balmoral and saw a more relaxed uh, Queen. But I think we are all mourning the fact that somebody who was a constant in our lives has now passed away. It was just days ago that the Queen accepted the resignation of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. Tonight, he said, we think of her deep wisdom and historic understanding and her seemingly inexhaustible but understated sense of duty. This is our country's saddest day because she had a unique and simple power to make us happy. That is why we loved her. There was a sombre mood among politicians in Westminster and around the country. The Queen was an ever fixed mark in our lives. The world changed around us, politicians came and went. The Queen was our nation's constant. The Queen represented duty and courage, as well as warmth and compassion. The Queen was a living reminder of our collective past, of our greatest generation and the sacrifices made for our freedom today. Scotland loved, respected and admired her. And by all accounts, Her Majesty was really happier than when she was here in Scotland at her beloved Balmoral, a fact I have been privileged to observe personally. I hope it will be a source of comfort to her family that she spent her final days in a place that she loved so much. On behalf of the Welsh Government and people in all parts of Wales, I offer our deepest condolences to all Her Majesty's children and their families on this sad occasion. She will be sorely missed 
by the many organisations in Wales she championed and supported over so many decades as patron or as president. MPs have been accustomed to the Queen setting out government priorities in Parliament. Tomorrow, they will begin paying their tributes in the Commons. Leila Nathu, BBC News. Well, as we know, the Queen was not only the monarch for the United Kingdom, but she was also the head of state across 14 other Commonwealth countries. So how has the news been received across the world? Our diplomatic correspondent, James Landale, has been looking at the international response. From the moment the Queen's reign began in Kenya in 1952, she played a constant and significant role on the international stage. And today there was an outpouring of sorrow and regret in every corner of the globe. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so. The President of France, Emmanuel Macron, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth embodied the continuity and unity of the British nation for over 70 years. I keep the memory of a friend of France, a Queen of Hearts, who marked her country and her century forever. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. And the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said it is with deep sadness that we learned of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. On behalf of the Ukrainian people, we extend sincere condolences to the royal family, the entire United Kingdom and the Commonwealth over this irreparable loss. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who met the Queen in more peaceful times, offered his condolences, saying she'd enjoyed the love and respect of her subjects and authority on the world stage. She was dubbed by one of her biographers as Queen of the World, visiting hundreds of countries throughout her reign. She was monarch of 15 separate realms, the head of a commonwealth of some 56 nations. So there was no surprise that news of the Queen's death made headlines around the world. Königin Elisabeth II is tot. Das teilte der Buckingham Palast in London mit. Tonight at the White House, the flags were at half-mast. Throughout her reign, the Queen was a living embodiment of the transatlantic relationship, meeting no fewer than 12 US presidents. In a statement, President Biden described her as a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy. Barack Obama said she had reigned with grace, elegance and a tireless work ethic. Views echoed on the streets of Washington. I admire her greatly. Yeah, I'm so sorry that she's passed. I mean, she's an icon here, everywhere. Horrible. I've been reading about her my whole life. She's one of the sane people in the UK, like the US, and that's just sad. As head of the Commonwealth throughout her reign, the Queen nurtured and shaped a unique international organization whose leaders, past and present, relied on her wisdom and judgment. The last days of the Queen's life captures who she was in so many ways, working till the very end on behalf of the people she loved. And that is why I'm sure that we will receive the news of her passing with both emotions of deep sadness but also gratitude for a life that was utterly and completely devoted to the service of others. And it was to a meeting of Commonwealth leaders that the Queen made her last overseas tour in 2015, visiting Malta, an island she'd once called home, the bookend of a life of duty and diplomacy on the international stage. James Landell, BBC News. Well, let's go to uh, Washington, speak to the BBC's Gary O'Donoghue, who is at the British Embassy, uh, where President Biden, Gary, has just signed the Book of Condolences. Yes, he has. And actually, it was uh, 
quite an extraordinary short space of time really between the formal announcement of the Queen's death and a request from the White House that the President and the First Lady be allowed to come here and to pay their condolences. I think a sign of the strength of the relationship between Britain and the United States. That's something the Bidens wanted to do and wanted to do straight away. So they were welcomed here by the British ambassador, Dame Karen Pearce, and her husband. Uh, flowers were exchanged. They chatted. There were about three dozen or so members of embassy staff looking on. And Joe Biden sat for perhaps three minutes signing the book of condolences, three separate lines of text talking about the Queen's strength and her dignity. And as he stood up, he said, I mourn for you all. She was a great lady. And before he left, he spent a few minutes talking uh, with staff and cracking some jokes, getting some laughs out of them indeed. But I think a somber occasion, but also one that really does point up the nature of the, the close relationship, what often, often we call the special relationship between uh, the United States and Great Britain, obviously where the Queen was head uh, of state for 70 years. Yeah, it was a very warm statement from President Biden, who of course met her uh, recently in Cornwall at the G7 summit, which, uh, which we covered, Gary. Um, there's a line I wanted to pick out from his statement because it, it's important in historical terms. He said she was the first British monarch to people all around the world who could feel an immediate and personal connection with. And of course, the United States has a difficult history with the British monarchy. When you look back over the centuries, this was a, a new period at the turn of the 20th century, and she embodied that very different relationship. It's absolutely right. And when you think her father was George the, the Sixth uh, of, uh, of Britain, and it was only George the Third who the Americans called a tyrant. And that's why they had a revolution here. That's why they had the war of independence to free themselves from what they saw as the tyranny uh, of the British throne and indeed the tyranny of the British Parliament uh, 250 years ago. And I think you're right. It was a sort of an acknowledgement. And it's a, it's a difficult thing for American politicians brought up in the Republican uh, small r tradition uh, and big r tradition indeed in other cases to to acknowledge that monarchy can be a force for good. It goes against all their political and historical instincts. And so that is a huge tribute. And of course, he also paid tribute to her for showing solidarity with America after 9-11, teaching Americans, as he put it, that uh, you grieve because you love, according to his account of, of her words. So I think there was a genuine warmth there. And it's, it's, it is a, a tribute to the Queen's ability uh, to engage and to charm uh, world leaders, because if we're brutally honest, Joe Biden perhaps isn't the most pro-British president there's ever been. Uh, he sees himself as having a background, in an, an Irish background. He's been very critical of all sorts of elements of British policy. Uh, in Ireland, particularly recently over the Northern Ireland Protocol. But in this case, about this woman, about our monarch, he was absolutely unambiguous. Gary Donoghue in Washington, thank you very much for that. Uh, well, as you saw in James's report, there have been condolences sent from all around the world. At the United Nations, the Security Council held a minute's silence. Pope Francis praised Queen Elizabeth's steadfast faith and said he was praying for her eternal rest. The French leader, Emmanuel Macron, said he would remember the Queen as a, a friend of France. And in Germany, President Steinmeier said there are millions of Germans today in mourning united with the people of the United Kingdom. And as Gary has just been saying, in the United States, the flags over the White House and the Capitol building are at half-mast tonight. So let's go back to Washington and speak to our colleague, Cathy Kay, who is there for us. Hello, Cathy. Um, she met 13 of the 14 US presidents who served during her 17 years on the throne. And as we witnessed together, I think we covered Donald Trump's uh, visit to London. It was always a special moment for the public on both sides of the Atlantic when the Queen came together with a president, whoever it was. 
Yeah, I think it was a special moment for presidents too. You know, it's funny, isn't it? Here's the president of the United States who has all of this hard power, the biggest military in the world, the biggest economy in the world. And I would watch them, successive presidents, go over and meet the queen as she got kind of smaller and frailer. And they would go jelly need over her. I mean, it was really, it was so odd. It was like watching kind of presidents become schoolboys again. And and that was almost without exception. Interestingly, I was uh, having a conversation with somebody who used to work in the Obama administration. And they said that the only president who flew over for his first meeting with the queen, not completely awestruck, was Barack Obama. He, he just didn't quite buy into the pomp and circumstance of it all. And yet he too was won over by her and was one of the, I think it's the only president to have made a visit to Buckingham Palace to see the Queen even after he was no longer president. They became apparently close and got on extremely well. So she had this effect, this woman on the other side of the Atlantic who was growing older and growing frailer, frailer had this effect on American presidents where despite their power and despite all that they could do politically around the world that she was not engaged in, of course, she somehow had the upper hand when they went to meet her. And it was something, it was a badge of honour for every American president to go and meet the Queen. I like to think of US presidents going jelly knee, but but you're right. <laughs> I think it, it really was like that. And and, and you're right to, 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 to point out the, the relationship that she managed to build with them. I, I was reading that the, her first trip to Washington was in 1957 and uh, she met President Dwight Eisenhower, who, of course, she would know all about because he'd played such a significant role in, in World War II. And they wrote each other letters for years. In fact, <laughs> she even sent him recipes for scones. Yeah, I read that too, because he had had scones at a picnic in Balmoral and apparently liked them. Lord knows whether he ever made the scones. I can't see Ike sitting in the kitchen making scones, but who knows? <laughs> anyway, so she sent him the recipe for scones and they did. She had this relationship back and forth with American presidents. And particularly think again about Ronald Reagan, who went and stayed, I think is the only president ever to have stayed in Windsor Castle. She bonded with him over riding. Um, they loved horses, both of them. They went famously, there's that photograph of the two of them at Windsor Castle on horseback. And, and she carried on that relationship with him. She went to California to visit him and they were going to go riding. The weather, you know, didn't cooperate. So they didn't go riding. But she managed to find some connection with American presidents. And I think that's why today you've been hearing them say not just about her legacy as a monarch, but repeatedly what a kind woman she was or how much they got on with her personally, what a great sense of humour she was. And I think that's something that they appreciated, that she made the effort to make some kind of personal con connection with presidents who, let's face it, like prime ministers, were going to come and go. She outlived them all. You know, she, mm. she just got used to one president and she'd have to roll out the red carpet or, or buckle up the jet to fly over and meet another president. But she made the effort with each of them to find some kind of personal connection. And and that is something that you've seen in the tributes that they've paid her today. She was inscrutable. You never knew what she was thinking. And, and though she was a stickler for the protocol and the, the tradition, she would never embarrass or put a world leader on edge if that particular figure hugged her or walked in front of her, whatever it might be. And US presidents and presidents of families, uh, families of presidents, I should say, did do that at times. I thought you were going to go to Donald Trump. You and I both covered that visit, right? <laughs> um, when he went and he broke protocol and the British public in particular was appalled by it. American public was appalled by it too, because you just didn't do it. You didn't work, walk in front of the Queen. You didn't keep the Queen waiting. I suspect she was unflappable about those kind of things, though, don't you? I mean, she, she'd she been there so long. She'd seen it all. She managed to somehow rise above that kind of incident and didn't take herself or or the faux pas of others too seriously. Michelle Obama famously wrote in her memoir, because that was the other faux pas that's been in modern times when Michelle Obama put her arm on hand on the on the Queen's back. Um, and the Queen responded by sort of hugging her back again or by putting her hand back again on Michelle Obama. And Michelle Obama wrote in her memoirs it's about that incident and what an uproar it had cause that she too had broken protocol. And she said it showed the humanity in Her Majesty, that she wasn't just a stickler for protocol, but she was a human being. And I, I just think it was a tribute that they all, again, you know, something perhaps that presidents appreciated in her, um, that she was able to not exactly cast protocol aside, but not let it get in the way of the relationship if a faux pas was made. Mm.
I, I always remember, um, I was at a, a state dinner that, that she attended in, in Paris, and Francois Hollande, who was the then president, uh, he came to talk to us and he said he'd had a, a jelly need moment uh, riding down the Champs Elysees from the tomb of the unknown soldier um, because he knew he was in the presence of history. Um, this was a woman who'd had a relationship with Charles de Gaulle and, and he said on the day that they'd driven down the Champs Elysees there were bigger crowds than for his inauguration. Although it did rain, it did rain when his inauguration was on so maybe that explained it. But it, it does sort of speak as, uh, of the awe in which world leaders uh, did hold her. Uh, uh, let yeah, me ask you this, Caddy. I mean, we, we, yeah. we live in, I mean, in your country, in, in the United States where you are and here in the UK, we live in a multi faith, multi ethnic society. There is much greater social mobility than when the Queen came to the throne. And the monarchy is, is not that, it's, it's hereditary, it's privilege, it's a white family born into power. So why, why is it so popular in the United States and overseas? And, and is it what she embodied, that sort of humility that you describe? I mean, is it her? Is it the position of the monarchy? Is it just the longevity of somebody who's been there 70 years and has been a kind of constant figure in a world in tumult, who's seen the Cold War come and go, who's seen successive presidents come and go, as we've been talking about? Is it... Is it any, or is it the package of all of those things? And when the now the Queen has gone and we have King Charles III, will there be that same fascination? It'll be interesting to see how it plays out, Christian, whether the sort of sense of reverence holds. You've got all of these divisions in the royal family. How are those handled? In, and in a way, it was the Queen that kind of overcame those divisions in, in the American eyes because she was not part of them. She rose above them and they respected her for that. It'll be really interesting to see whether kind of America's love affair, if you like, with monarchy survives past the Queen. Yet I think they'll focus on, Eliz on William and Kate and they are attracted to them as a young, glamorous couple. Americans like glamour. They like the glamour side of the, of the royal family. But I wonder what, whether it will be a slightly different, um, a, a, a different relationship between the US and not just, not the United Kingdom, but between the US and the royal family now that the Queen is no longer there. It will be one to watch as King Charles III takes up his reign. Caddy Kay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Caddy Kay joining us from Washington. And many of the thoughts that Caddy was talking about there reflected, I think, in the statement of President Biden today. A stateswoman, he said, of unmatched dignity and constancy who deepened the bedrock alliance between our two countries. She brought such dignity to the job, he said, a sense of duty, service, humility in an ever-shifting world in a deeply political, partisan world, she brought a sense of reassurance of continuity. And I think that is very much the theme uh, that many will be reflecting on tonight. You are watching continuing coverage, reflecting on the life and death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The BBC's Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, looks back. Under Admiralty Arch, into Trafalgar Square, the tumult of welcome and love surrounds her. I here present unto you Queen Elizabeth, your undoubted queen. Is Your Majesty willing to take the oath? I am willing. She was 27 when she took the coronation oath. Will you solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? I solemnly promise so to do. She was anointed, Will blessed and consecrated. Law and justice. <laughs> She took possession of a 1,200-year-old throne. She knew that it was a role from which only death could release her. And yet, when she was born, no one had thought that it would be her destiny. 
Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was born on the 21st of April 1926. She was the first child of the then King's second son, the Duke of York. She cried at her christening, perhaps the only time in her life that she made a public scene. She was a happy child with, occasionally, a child's sense of mischief. This was the young Princess Elizabeth at the age of four and three quarters on a visit to a photographic studio in London. She was soon to learn the self-discipline expected of the royal family. A politician called Winston Churchill noted that she had an air of authority that was astonishing in an infant. Fate propelled that infant towards the throne. In 1936, her uncle, King Edward VIII, abandoned the crown in order to marry the twice-divorced American, Wallace Simpson. Elizabeth's father reluctantly took the throne. His coronation gave Elizabeth a foretaste of what lay in store for her. She later wrote that she'd found the service very, very wonderful. Elizabeth's childhood was a sheltered one. She never went to school, but was educated at home with her younger sister, Margaret. But the family unit was strong. Her father, George VI, was devoted to her and she to him. Throughout her life, he was to be her inspiration. In July 1939, the King took his daughters to the Royal Naval College at Dartmouth, and there amongst the cadets was the young Prince Philip of Greece. It wasn't the first time they'd met. It was, though, the first time they'd taken an interest in each other. But Europe was on the brink of war. The Nazis were on the march. Britain was preparing to defend itself, and as children were being evacuated from Britain's cities, Elizabeth made her first radio broadcast. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your homes and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. Night after night during the Blitz, German bombs fell on Britain. The King and Queen refused to send Elizabeth and her sister abroad. The royal family symbolised the United Kingdom's fight against tyranny. Buckingham Palace was bombed, and Elizabeth briefly joined up. She was taught how to drive and service an army lorry. As Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace. Elizabeth joined her family on the balcony and, later that evening, she slipped out with friends to join the crowds, as she later recalled. We cheered the King and Queen on the balcony and then walked miles through the streets. I remember lines of unknown people linking arms and walking down Whitehall. All of us just swept along on a tide of happiness and relief. With the war over, there was an opportunity to relax. And for Elizabeth, there was another reason to be happy. She'd fallen in love. Her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, as he was now called, was announced in July 1947. Four months later, they were married in Westminster Abbey. Seldom has a bride and groom received such a tumultuous expression of goodwill. A year later, their first child, Charles, was born. Two years after that, a daughter, Anne. By now, Philip had resumed his naval career. He was posted to the Mediterranean island of Malta, where he was joined by his wife. It was the most carefree time of their married life, but it wasn't to last. The king was in poor health. He'd been treated for lung cancer. When Elizabeth left for a trip to East Africa in February 1952, it was to be the last time she would see him. It was a farewell. It was also, as events turned out, goodbye. At the moment of her father's death from a heart attack, Elizabeth was in a game park in Kenya. The news that she was now queen was given to her by her husband. Her tour of the Commonwealth cancelled. The princess we knew as a girl and watched in the even growth of her stature comes back to meet her ministers as queen. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young, and so it was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. 
Britain was stunned at the loss of its wartime king. His coffin was brought by train from Sandringham to London. Elizabeth was there to receive it with her mother and sister. George VI was laid to rest after a state funeral. Elizabeth's accession was proclaimed. To bless the royal princess Elizabeth II with long and happy years to reign over us. God save the Queen. Britain pledged its loyalty to its new monarch, a glamorous woman in her mid-twenties who seemed to symbolize all the country's post-war hopes. There was talk of a new Elizabethan era. And now here comes Her Majesty. Elizabeth's coronation in June 1953 was one of the biggest public celebrations in Britain's recent history. For the first time, television cameras were allowed into Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to millions. The moment of the Queen's crowning is come. As Elizabeth was crowned, she accepted what to her was a sacred duty, an obligation to serve, which was to set her apart for the remainder of her life. Elizabeth was sovereign and head of state, not just of the United Kingdom, but of Britain's realms and territories in every continent. Sydney siders turn out to greet their queen. In late 1953, she set off on the first of many overseas tours with a six month trip to Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. This is a joyous, spine-tingling welcome. The young queen was a star on the world stage and her popularity was never greater. It's estimated that in Australia, three quarters of the country's entire population turned out to see her in person. And a great roar of cheering pours out from tens of thousands of friends. The trip was a huge personal success. A happy picture of this fairy queen who has, it seems, come magically amongst us. But as the 1950s gave way to the swinging 60s of the Beatles, attitudes started to change. Old certainties were questioned. The monarchy was seen by some to be stuffy and out of touch. Elizabeth was always cautious about change, but shrewd enough to recognise that the monarchy needed to move with the times. On some matters, though, she showed a less certain touch when a coal tip in Aberfan collapsed onto a school, killing 116 children. Elizabeth was urged to visit the village. Initially, she declined. She finally went to Aberfan eight days after the disaster. Although a supremely dutiful monarch, she found public emotion difficult to handle. Her sense of duty also at times interfered with her family role. Her son and heir, Charles, had been a sensitive child who found his mother's absences difficult and wounding. And her husband, Philip, was a restless man who sometimes found his role as consort frustrating. On one occasion, the palace had to deny rumours that the marriage was in difficulty. In fact, it was a partnership from which Elizabeth was to derive great strength and reassurance. In the early 60s, they had two more children, Prince Andrew, born in 1960, and Prince Edward in March 1964. By the late 60s, the palace realised that it needed to take the initiative. The result was a groundbreaking documentary. The film Royal Family showed the monarchy as it had never been seen before. Elizabeth was shown performing the daily business of the sovereign, working on the official documents which were delivered to her virtually every day. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? The American Ambassador, Your Majesty. And meeting visiting dignitaries. We're in the embassy residence, mm. subject, of course, to some of the discomfiture as a result of a need for uh, elements of refurbishing, rehabilitation. For her Silver Jubilee in 1977, there were carnivals, street parties and pageants. Elizabeth had by then been queen for a quarter of a century, during which Britain had changed profoundly. Yet the monarchy seemed as secure in the public's affection as it had ever been. And that was very largely due to the queen herself. Her commitment remained absolute. My Lord Mayor, 
When I was 21, I pledged my life to the service of our people, and I asked for God's help to make good that vow. Although that vow was made in my salad days when I was green in judgment, I do not regret nor attract one word of it. Violence breached the royal circle in 1979 when the Duke's uncle, Earl Mountbatten, was murdered off the west coast of Ireland by the IRA. The vulnerability of the Queen herself was exposed at the Trooping the Colour ceremony in 1981. A disturbed youth in the crowd had a gun. Blank shots were fired as the Queen rode past. Despite the pandemonium, she brought her horse under control and carried on. There was concern again a year later when it emerged that an intruder had entered Buckingham Palace one morning and found his way into the Queen's bedroom. She kept him talking until help arrived. Good evening, Your Majesty. You've had a very long, yes. long day. Yes. Britain by now had its first woman Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Relations between female head of state and female head of government were sometimes said to have been strained. One at times difficult area was the Queen's devotion to the Commonwealth, of which she was head. Elizabeth knew the leaders of sub-Saharan Africa well and was sympathetic to their cause. She said to have found Mrs Thatcher's attitude and confrontational style puzzling. With this ring... With this ring... I thee wed. I thee wed. For the Queen and her family, the 1980s had begun with a moment of great promise. Prince Charles's wedding in July 1981 to the young Lady Diana Spencer seemed to be a moment of hope for the future. The new Princess of Wales captured the public imagination and became a media superstar. Consequently, when the marriage began to fail, its decline was a very public one. When the couple's separation was announced in 1992, it followed the collapse of the first marriage of the Queen's daughter, Princess Anne, and a series of lurid stories involving the Queen's other daughter-in-law, the Duchess of York, whose marriage to Prince Andrew had also ended. In a revealing speech to mark her 40 years on the throne, the Queen described 1992 as her annus horribilis, her horrible year, and conceded the need for a more open monarchy in return for a less hostile media. New institution, city, monarchy, whatever, should expect to be free from the scrutiny of those who give it their loyalty and support, not to mention those who don't. But we are all part of the same fabric of our national society. And that scrutiny by one part of another can be just as effective if it is made with a touch of gentleness, good humour and understanding. To compound the misery, a few days earlier the Queen had seen part of her favourite home, Windsor Castle, destroyed by fire. She was devastated. The fire seemed to symbolise the reversal of the royal family's fortunes, difficulties which were exacerbated by a public row over who should pay for the castle's repairs. But even worse was to follow. The death of the by now divorced Diana, Princess of Wales, in a car crash in Paris in August 1997 was to provoke what, for the Queen, was a shocking backlash against the monarchy. She'd remained at Balmoral with Princes William and Harry after Diana died. Her priority had been to care for her grandsons. But to the grieving crowds outside Buckingham Palace and elsewhere, it seemed as though the royal family simply didn't care. It provoked some of the most hostile headlines of her reign. The Queen herself was being called to account. There followed a hastily planned return to the palace to inspect the thousands of flowers left in Diana's memory. And in an unprecedented live broadcast on the eve of Diana's funeral, the Queen tried to heal the breach that had opened between the palace and the people. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. 
The Queen promised to learn the lessons from Diana's life and the reaction to her death. The whole episode had shaken her. For the first time, she'd appeared to be out of tune with the feelings of her people. The decommissioning of the royal yacht Britannia was another moment of sadness. It had been there for so many of the happy moments of her life, for family holidays around the Scottish islands and state occasions the world over. For once, after so many other difficulties, the Queen's distress was evident. With Charles's marriage to his long-term companion Camilla Parker Bowles in April 2005, the royal family was finally able to turn the page on the domestic anguish of previous decades. It was time to move on. For the Queen, it was a moment of relief, and in the years that followed, with scarcely any lessening of her workload, she appeared to enjoy her role with renewed enthusiasm. In 2011, she was at Westminster Abbey for the wedding of her grandson, Prince William, to Catherine Middleton. It was a moment when the public's appreciation for the monarchy seemed to be reconfirmed. A few weeks later, at the age of 85, the Queen made one of the most important foreign visits of her reign when she became the first British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland. She laid a wreath in memory of those Irish nationalists who'd risen up against the Crown and, at a state dinner in Dublin Castle, she spoke with regret about Britain's treatment of Ireland. With the benefit of historical hindsight, we can all see things which we would wish had been done differently, or not at all. The following year in Belfast, she met and shook hands with Martin McGuinness, a former leader of the IRA who by then was Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. It was another significant gesture of reconciliation. Her diamond jubilee in 2012 confirmed the nation's regard for a monarch who'd reigned for 60 years. Mr. Bond, Your Majesty. It was also the year when the Queen showed that she too could spring a surprise. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Sovereign and secret agent one of the highlights of the opening night of the London Olympics. By the time of her 90th birthday in April 2016, she'd become the United Kingdom's longest reigning monarch, its oldest, and few would disagree, one of its most deeply respected. It was rare for Elizabeth to speak about her life as monarch. There were occasional insights though, this from a BBC documentary. It's a question of maturing in, into something that one's got used to doing and accepting the fact that here you are and, and it's your fate. She continued with her public duties well into her 90s. There was further family turmoil though. Prince Andrew was forced to withdraw from public life amid claims he'd sexually assaulted a 17-year-old, claims he denied. And then the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, decided that they wanted to step back from royal life. They moved to California and gave a television interview in which Meghan made damaging criticisms of the royal family. They were unsettling moments, presided over by a monarch who showed that her sense of commitment was undiminished. Together we are tackling this disease. During the coronavirus emergency of 2020, she broadcast a reassuring message to the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. Her words seemed to encapsulate her role as monarch, drawing on her own long experience to help settle the nation at a moment of difficulty. Her resilience was evident again in April 2021, when her beloved husband Philip died two months short of his 100th birthday. They'd been married for 73 years. At Philip's funeral at St George's Chapel within Windsor Castle, she seemed a solitary figure, pausing at one point to turn and look back. 
The figure who'd been two paces behind her for so many years was now absent. But despite the great sadness of her loss, there was never any question of her withdrawing from the path of duty. She marked the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne, a record no other monarch had achieved, in February 2022. Oh, yes, yes, By then it was apparent that she was rather more frail physically than before, though mentally as sharp as ever. <laughs> her doctors had advised her to take things a little easier. Light duties was the expression used by the palace, but every day there were red boxes full of official papers to deal with. In a message to mark her 70 years on the throne, she said she was humbled by the loyalty and affection she'd received throughout her reign. And she signed the statement, Your Servant, Elizabeth R. By June 2022 and the public celebration of her Platinum Jubilee, her declining health limited the events she could attend. There was, however, a delightful surprise. A pre-recorded appearance, a somewhat chaotic tea party with Paddington Bear. Um, perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich? I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you for everything. That's very kind. This was a monarch at peace and enjoying herself. On the final day of the Jubilee celebrations, there was a final appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. The national anthem was sung. A much-loved monarch acknowledged the many thousands who'd waited to greet her. The crowds cheered and cheered but finally it was time to go. The Queen turned to depart from the balcony on which she'd first been seen as a baby. There was an unspoken feeling that an era was drawing to a close. Throughout her reign, Elizabeth II embodied the strengths of a constitutional monarch a constant and reassuring presence at the centre of our national life. For decade after decade, she represented a changing kingdom to itself and to the world. Above all, hers was a life guided by Christian faith and driven by a profound sense of duty and by the pledge she made to the world on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it.
Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in the history of the United Kingdom and the commanding presence in British public life over a span of eight decades. She died at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96. The Queen's eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become King Charles III. It was at half past six this evening that Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Following the death of his mother, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth, and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. The Queen had symbolised all that was constant and reassuring, and for the vast majority of people in Britain and the Commonwealth, a treasured and highly visible link with Britain's past has now gone. Our Royal Correspondent Daniela Relf looks back on a momentous day. Tuesday the 6th of September. The last photographs of the Queen, 96 years old and still at work. Meeting the new Prime Minister at Balmoral, a duty she had been keen to fulfil, and one we now know was her final duty, after seven decades of public service. Around four o'clock this afternoon, a number of the Queen's family arrived at Aberdeen Airport. Her grandson, the Duke of Cambridge, was first to emerge, followed by her daughter-in-law, Sophie, the Countess of Wessex, and then her two youngest sons, Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and Andrew, the Duke of York. The Duke of Cambridge drove the family group to Balmoral to join his father and other members of the family already there with the Queen. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, arrived separately later in the evening. Here in the UK for a number of charity events, his wife Meghan did not accompany him to Scotland. At 6.30, Buckingham Palace officially announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Following tradition, the statement was attached to the palace gates by two footmen as tributes began. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. And also from the leader of the opposition. For the vast majority of us, the late Queen has been simply the Queen, the only Queen. Above all else, our Queen. As we mourn her loss, we should also treasure her life, our longest serving and greatest ever monarch. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. Throughout the day, there had been growing unease about the Queen's health. In the Commons, as Keir Starmer stood up to speak, Opposite him, the Prime Minister was being told of the Queen's condition. Information passed to Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader, who left her seat for a while to discuss the development, before the Speaker of the House addressed the chamber. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best, best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. Cheered by onlookers, one of the Queen's last royal engagements was in July, with her daughter, Princess Anne, opening a new state-of-the-art hospice in Berkshire. 
But these kind of visits had become rare over the past year. As the Queen relied on her walking stick, her mobility compromised. The royal household had tried to adapt to keep her active and visible. A golf buggy at the Chelsea Flower Show helped keep the Queen comfortable. But she had become noticeably thinner and frailer, something that severely limited her involvement in her own Platinum Jubilee celebrations, with her family increasingly representing her. At the weekend, her son stood in at the Braemar Highland Games, always a favourite event for the Queen that she reluctantly missed. Like so much of her life, the decline in her health was played out in public. Duty may have got harder to manage physically, but mentally, even emotionally, the Queen remained engaged and working to the very end. Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister, has led tribute to the Queen, calling her a bright and shining light that has finally gone out. The First Ministers of Wales and Scotland have also paid their respects, honouring her deep sense of duty and her resilience. Our political correspondent, Leila Nathu, reflects on their words. Flags being lowered to half-mast at Downing Street this evening. Tonight, former residents paid tribute to the Queen, who'd asked them to form a government. The example, the duty, the selflessness, the way in which other people were put first, the way in which we hand, she handled crisis with great stoicism when they occurred, as they occurred a number of times during her reign. They were all examples to people about how to behave in their own lives and examples for our country. Her longest serving Prime Minister, Sir Tony Blair, said, we have lost not just our monarch, but the matriarch of our nation, the figure who more than any other brought our country together, kept us in touch with our better nature, personified everything which makes us proud to be British. Gordon Brown took over the Labour government in 2007. He reflected tonight on the impression the Queen made around the world. Everywhere I went, Her Majesty was respected, she was admired, she was revered, and we will miss her greatly. There is no monarch who has served so long with such popularity and held in such high esteem and dedicated ourselves so much to the future of our country. David Cameron returned the Conservatives to power in 2010. He said of the Queen, there can be no finer example of dignified public duty and unstinting service, saying we all owe our sincere gratitude for her continued devotion. I was fortunate to have been able to call on the knowledge of the world's greatest public servant and indeed the world's most experienced diplomat. In 2016, the Queen appointed Theresa May as Britain's second female Prime Minister. I was fortunate enough to be able to meet her in different circumstances, including in the weekly audiences, uh, uh, but also at, at Balmoral and saw a more relaxed uh, Queen. But I think we are all mourning the fact that somebody who was a constant in our lives has now passed away. It was just days ago that the Queen accepted the resignation of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. Tonight, he said, we think of her deep wisdom and historic understanding and her seemingly inexhaustible but understated sense of duty. This is our country's saddest day because she had a unique and simple power to make us happy. That is why we loved her. There was a sombre mood among politicians in Westminster and around the country. The Queen was an ever-fixed mark in our lives. The world changed around us, politicians came and went. The Queen was our nation's constant. The Queen represented duty and courage, as well as warmth and compassion. The Queen was a living reminder of our collective past, of our greatest generation, and the sacrifices made for our freedom today. Scotland loved, respected, and admired her. And by all accounts, Her Majesty was really happier than when she was here in Scotland at her beloved Balmoral, a fact I have been privileged to observe personally. I hope it will be a source of comfort to her family that she spent her final days in a place that she loved so much. On behalf of the Welsh Government and people in all parts of Wales, 
I offer our deepest condolences to all Her Majesty's children and their families on this sad occasion. She will be sorely missed by the many organisations in Wales she championed and supported over so many decades as patron or as president. MPs have been accustomed to the Queen setting out government priorities in Parliament. Tomorrow, they will begin paying their tributes in the Commons. Leila Nathu, BBC News. Well, as we know, the Queen was not only the monarch for the United Kingdom, but she was also the head of state across 14 other Commonwealth countries. So how has the news been received across the world? Our diplomatic correspondent James Landale has been looking at the international response. From the moment the Queen's reign began in Kenya in 1952, she played a constant and significant role on the international stage. And today there was an outpouring of sorrow and regret in every corner of the globe. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so. The President of France, Emmanuel Macron, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth embodied the continuity and unity of the British nation for over 70 years. I keep the memory of a friend of France, a Queen of Hearts, who marked her country and her century forever. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. And the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said it is with deep sadness that we learned of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. On behalf of the Ukrainian people, we extend sincere condolences to the royal family, the entire United Kingdom and the Commonwealth over this irreparable loss. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who met the Queen in more peaceful times, offered his condolences, saying she'd enjoyed the love and respect of her subjects and authority on the world stage. She was dubbed by one of her biographers as Queen of the World, visiting hundreds of countries throughout her reign. She was monarch of 15 separate realms, the head of a commonwealth of some 56 nations. So there was no surprise that news of the Queen's death made headlines around the world. Königin Elisabeth II is tot. Das teilte der Buckingham Palast in London mit. Tonight at the White House, the flags were at half-mast. Throughout her reign, the Queen was a living embodiment of the transatlantic relationship, meeting no fewer than 12 US presidents. In a statement, President Biden described her as a stateswoman of unmatched dignity and constancy. Barack Obama said she had reigned with grace, elegance and a tireless work ethic. Views echoed on the streets of Washington. I admire her greatly. Yeah, I'm so sorry that she's passed. I mean, she's an icon here, everywhere. Horrible. I've been reading about her my whole life. She's one of the sane people in the UK, like the US, and that's just sad. As head of the Commonwealth throughout her reign, the Queen nurtured and shaped a unique international organization whose leaders, past and present, relied on her wisdom and judgment. The last days of the Queen's life captures who she was in so many ways, working to the very end on behalf of the people she loved. And that is why I'm sure that we will receive the news of her passing with both emotions of deep sadness, but also gratitude for a life that was utterly and completely devoted to the service of others. And it was to a meeting of Commonwealth leaders that the Queen made her last overseas tour in 2015, visiting Malta, an island she'd once called home, the bookend of a life of duty and diplomacy on the international stage. James Landell, BBC News.
Yes, the family of Commonwealth nations, and that is very much how the Queen saw it. Let's uh, speak to Helen Clark. She is the former Prime Minister of New Zealand. Ms Clark, you're very welcome to the programme. Um, New Zealand, a, a key part of the Queen's realm, uh, an important member of the Commonwealth. How will they react to news of the Queen's death? I think overwhelmingly the reaction is one of great sadness. The Queen was very much respected in New Zealand. She visited here a number of times during her, her long reign. Uh, her coronation tours brought her to New Zealand uh, for Christmas New Year 1953-54, for example, and she, she kept coming. Uh, huge respect for her, and I think that the, the sadness uh, you see expressed in the United Kingdom today will be mirrored here in New Zealand, where so many of us uh, trace our roots back to the United Kingdom as well. Another Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, said she was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful. Was she helpful to Prime Ministers of New Zealand? Do you have personal memories? I have a lot of personal memories uh, of meeting with the Queen. Uh, the last uh, substantive meeting I had with her as PM was when I came to Windsor Castle, where she hosted the most beautiful memorial service for Sir Edmund Hillary, who was a Knight of the Garter. And the Garter, of course, is returned after someone passes away. Now, remember also that uh, Sir Edmund Hillary's ascent of uh, Everest happened uh, when the Queen was a very young Queen. And this was also seen as a high point for uh, the, the British Commonwealth family, that a citizen of the Commonwealth had had, had with his uh, Sherpa, uh, Tenzing Nor Norgay, got to the very top of, of, of Everest. So lots of special memories from that occasion and many others. She had such a deep well of experience because her reign spanned such a large arc of history. Did you find that useful? Was it, was it without prying into the conversations that you had with her, was it, was it that experience that she was able to share that, that became helpful? Yes, uh, over the Queen's very long life, she met leaders, personalities from around the world. You could raise with the Queen any place on earth and she'd either been there or she'd met the leader or she knew something about it. And this wasn't just an issue of having official briefs. Uh, she had that lifetime of knowledge accumulated uh, from watching the issues and being engaged with people and visiting places. So she was like a, a walking encyclopedia, if you like, of, of people, places and events. You mentioned the, the visit in um, 1953. It's extraordinary to think back, isn't it, that um, the United Kingdom had just had a coronation for its queen and then she disappeared to the other side of the world for six months. I mean, yes. these days we... We travel so freely and we live in the age of the internet. But back then, your queen disappearing to the other side of the world and she stayed in New Zealand for almost a month. That, If there was a high point in New Zealand royalty, it must have been that moment. Yes, and, and also at that time, there was a terrible tragedy on Christmas Eve when the main express train from the capital, Wellington, to Auckland uh, went into a river after a volcanic uh, event had taken out a railway bridge. And the Queen was here for that. So she was part of that national mourning for dozens and dozens of people who died in that terrible tragedy. So people always remember her, her kindness at that time as well. Talk to me about um, the period over the next week, because we are heading now into a period of official mourning. Um, what will happen in New Zealand? How will they, they mark uh, the passing of the Queen? So, as in the United Kingdom, you will see the, the flags at half-mast uh, throughout uh, New Zealand. Uh, it's expected that the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, will travel to the United Kingdom for the funeral, and that when she returns, there will be a full uh, New Zealand uh, national service of memorial. So I think for now we will there will be tributes in, in Parliament. I, I would think that Parliament would probably do the tributes and, and, and adjourn at the point that it's next uh, due to meet, which would be uh, next Tuesday. Uh, then New Zealand will be very focused on what is happening in the United Kingdom and the period of mourning there leading up to the, the funeral. And then at that time when the Prime Minister's back, we will have 
our special tributes here. Hmm. We were saying earlier this evening that it's it's going to be an enormous period of adjustment for all of us and for New Zealand. Um, her picture hangs in government offices and no doubt it's on some of the stamps and the coins in New Zealand as well. And now we have to get used to saying King Charles III. Uh, constitutionally, do, constitutionally, <laughs> does it make any difference to New Zealand? I, I don't think so. Uh, uh, in his capacity as Prince of Wales, uh, uh, the now King Charles has been to New Zealand a number of times. I've personally had the privilege of interacting with him a number of times. I have a great deal of uh, respect for uh, the king, he picked up issues like sustainability and climate change years before it was particularly fashionable. And New Zealand is very environmentally conscious. So I think uh, we we will see in him someone who, who mirrors our values in, in those areas. So I, I think, you know, life will go on here at some point, no doubt, as in Barbados, as elsewhere, the debate will revive about New Zealand's constitutional status as a monarchy. But that that's not for now. Just on that issue, um, it's so often in public life, the, the nation becomes the person and at some point the strings are broken and that is upsetting and destabilising for all of us. The ties, the deep ties between our two countries, does that flow solely through the Queen or, or do you think it, it stretches much further than that? Is that the legacy that she leaves? I think I think it's part of the package of the the legacy. So many of us in New Zealand uh, have our forebears from the United Kingdom. All of my forebears came from the United Kingdom, New Zealand, from the kind of mid nineteenth uh, century uh, onwards. So there there is that affinity and family connection, and and with that goes an affinity with the uh, the institutions of the United Kingdom, which includes the monarchy, includes the, the legacy of uh, Westminster-style democracy, uh, the, the nature of the court system, and, and so much else. So in many ways, we remain tied, even while New Zealand stands as a, a proud, independent country today. Helen Clark, thank you very much for your thoughts and your reflections. It's very good to talk to you. Uh, it is... Uh, just after lunchtime there in New Zealand. It is 25 past one in the morning here in London, but there are still many people gathered outside Buckingham Palace and it has not been good weather here in London. Let's speak to Kashi Madeira, who is there for us, just people who want to be part of it. And we can already see behind you, Kasia, the, the start of the tributes that are being paid, the flowers that are being laid on the, on the gates and on the railings of Buckingham Palace. Christian, you mentioned the weather. It's just starting to rain once again here. It's been pouring earlier on today, but it's not stopped people from coming. People absolutely want to just be here, to be together, to pay their respects, and also just to mark this historic moment. And as you rightly say, the flowers are already beginning to be pinned to the gates of Buckingham Palace. And if you just come with me to see the candles that have been set up, people coming from all over the world wanting to pay their respects. Earlier on, there were a couple of thousand people here all milling around wanting to just have a moment to reflect about what is happening. But like I say, now the crowds are diminishing a little bit. We've got fewer and fewer people, but people still come from all over the world, in fact. This is Mark. Mark, you're originally from South, South Africa, Africa yeah. but you're an Australian citizen national now. citizen. And you're here now, why? Yeah. Um, just on holiday, actually. <laughs> but in terms of here at Buckingham Palace, oh, right, why yeah, did you Buckingham, want to be oh, here? Because I guess um, I was fortunate enough to be here when Diana passed away and to be in London at the time of her funeral and when all of that happened. And I remember it being a very moving and emotional event. And I suppose, you know, the Queen for us is also the head of our state and uh, our country. And I feel you know, one needs to come and pay your respects and to, to live history. This is living history, being here right now and being in, being able to be part of all of this and to share in the sadness. And it is a very sad occasion. And, and there's a lot of people who want to be together and just... Yeah, a sense of community. Yeah. And I think 
It's, it always amazes me how something like this brings people together, not just in England, but all around the world. And, and there, are, there are people milling around and just waiting, and not, lots of people everywhere. If you just take a look, this, this gentleman has come on a mobility scooter. There are people from everywhere who want to just be in one place together. Mark, thank you very much for thank speaking you. to us. And like I say, the numbers of people has reduced, but this group caught my eye because earlier on they, they were, they've just come from a function and yet they want to be here. There's a whole host of them with a black tie event, I believe it was. Yes, yes, yeah, so we're only 10 minutes away. Just thought we should walk down and pay our respects and see what was happening here. And when you say you want to pay your respects of course it's it's we're seeing fewer people but it's it's still surprising that there are so, well surprising I say there's still many many people that want to be here together I think so yeah I think it's it's a moment in time that we're not going to see for a long time and it's it's perfect it's a good opportunity for people to come together and pay their respects so it's a collective sorrow a sorrow of a nation and a sorrow of a people that are coming together and it, it does, it feels somber, it feels a surreal experience being here, but it was something that we were, we were drawn to, we, we wanted to be here. And you broke into, well, <clears throat> you, your night was finishing, I believe, because yes. you had the, the, the bow ties here, but in terms of just reflecting on the legacy of Her Majesty? Yeah, we just thought uh, we were so close by that we ought to come and pay our respects and uh, yeah, just be part of the, uh, the emotion of the evening. And earlier on we were hearing people spontaneously sing God Save the King. How, how does that make you feel? It's a bit of a strange feeling because you've grown up with the Queen and the King doesn't feel like a natural thing for us as a British person, but it's something we'll have to trans transition to with Charles and ultimately William. So, yeah, it's something that we'll move on with and uh, it's a sad day, but something that we'll move on to and singing God Save the Queen. The, I say God Save the Queen, it's so natural, God Save the King, that will be such an adjustment for everyone, adults and children. Thank you, such an adjustment and just wanted to be here at the time of national morning. Thank you very much for your thoughts and we'll let you on get on to well the end of your evening now but thank you very much and as we were seeing this time and time again people just wanting to be at Buckingham Palace the official residence of Her Majesty where they can come and reflect and put up flowers and the flag the flag is flying at half mast at the moment and of course the notice is up further on on the gates making the announcement of the passing of Her Majesty and like I say people are still coming there are still people milling around wanting to pay their respects now we expect the Queen will lie in state for a number of days the funeral date will be announced by Buckingham Palace and we will be awaiting for that but at the moment this is a, a gathering of people who just want to be together and, and just have that moment because this is Christian a huge time of change for this nation yes and you do sense that Buckingham Palace, along with Windsor, is going to become the focal point for uh, the grief and the reflection uh, that the nation will go through over the next few days. And no doubt those flowers behind you uh, are going to become much more plentiful over uh, the coming week. Uh, Kasia Madeira at Buckingham Palace, thank you very much indeed. Nice to hear uh, people from Australia down there at the moment. We can speak to Juliet Reedon, who is a royal correspondent for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, editor-at-large at the Australian Women's Weekly. and the author of the book, The Royals in Australia. She joins us from Brisbane. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. Um, we were just talking to Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, ab about the, the visit that the Queen paid in 1953. And of course, uh, a large part of that trip was her visit to Australia. Tell us all about it. Yes, well, this was the, uh, the Queen's inaugural visit. She made 16 visits to Australia. This was the first one and also the first ever visit to the reigning monarch. So it was, it was very important. Of course, she had been en route to Australia when her father died, uh, when she was Princess Elizabeth. Uh, so the fact that uh, pretty much as soon as she was coronated, she then renewed that trip to Australia was very important to Australians. And 70% of the population turned out to see her. It was an absolutely mammoth trip. She was here for six weeks and she went to loads and loads of country towns as well as cities. 
There were people uh, when she when the SS Gothic sailed into Sydney Harbour. Um, there were more than a million people lining the streets of Sydney. It was an absolutely massive turnout. And I, I think there are many people now who were children at that time, and they remember that tour more than any other tour. And it really sticks in the memory. Children were very much part of the tour. They were very special parts of the tour. There were lots of organized displays where children took part. And of course, some of the very lucky ones would have handed posies to Her Majesty. So it really was, it, that cemented the uh, Australia's love affair with the Queen. And the fact, Julia, that she went to the more remote parts of Australia, did that bring her into contact with the indigenous population as well? And, and how, did that f how did that form her opinions of the indigenous community in Australia? The Queen um, did, did connect with the uh, Indigenous community then and, and on every tour. She made sure that there was always an Indigenous, uh, meeting Indigenous elders, meeting Indigenous families. In fact, over the years, she met many generations of the same families. And she did, that, that did forge this rather wonderful bond with the Indigenous elders here. I think that they felt that they could connect with the royal family and especially with the queen in a way that they weren't perhaps connecting with the politicians of the day that many of those indigenous elders were invited to buckingham palace for special audiences with the queen so there was this sense that the monarch was was listening to them and i think listening was one of her great strengths so talk to me about the reaction there in Australia. Clearly, um, the news of the Queen's condition came in the very early hours of the morning. Uh, how have people been reacting to it today? Deep, deep sadness um, and, and shock, actually. Uh, it sounds weird to, to say that we should be shocked that a 96-year-old who we knew was having some um, mobility issues and some health issues uh, passes. But I think we all expected, no doubt like you in England, that, she, that the Queen was going to go on forever. We just accepted her as, as our, our head of state and as part of part of our country, um, even though she was a long way away and hadn't, hadn't visited since 2011. But there were people here out on the streets who were hearing the news for the first time. My colleague was on her way into work here and um, was on a train and told people. And suddenly there was this big outpouring of emotion and everybody just wanted to talk about the Queen. And I think that will go on throughout the week. Julia Reardon, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us on the programme. Well, as Juliet just said, news of the Queen's death dominated headlines all over the world, from Commonwealth nations like India and Kenya to the United States. Let's hear from our team of international correspondents, starting with Anne Soy in Kenya, where then Princess Elizabeth first learned she was about to become Queen. It was here in Sagana, central Kenya, that then Princess Elizabeth became queen. She was on tour representing her ailing father when she received the news that he had sadly passed away. And it was a different time in history. Country after country on the continent were gaining independence. And even though they chose republicanism, they understood hereditary monarchy. And therefore, wherever she traveled on the continent, they understood her place they respected her and she played a key role in bringing them into the Commonwealth. As head of Commonwealth, she kept the organization together and grew it. To this day, it continues to expand and messages of condolence have been coming in from across the continent from leaders, including monarchs. And they recognize and deeply admire her service to the Commonwealth and to the world. Well, the flag is flying at half-staff here at the White House in honour of a reign that has seen the swearing-in of 13 US presidents. The Queen met 12 of them personally, and the last of that long line, Joe Biden, has issued a statement saying that in his meetings with her, she charmed him and the First Lady with her wit and moved them with her kindness. In recent years, of course, like elsewhere in the world, news coverage of the British monarchy has often been driven by intrigue and scandal. But today, 
As the major networks roll on events in Balmoral, there is a real sense of a moment in history. The last King of America was Queen Elizabeth II's great, great, great grandfather. And her time on the throne has been marked by an even further shift away from those colonial ties and towards a relationship of two independent modern nations defined by their shared democratic values. News of the Queen's death is dominating headlines here in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi put out this tweet saying, and I quote, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. She personified dignity and decency in public life. Pained by her demise, my thoughts are with her family and people of the UK in this sad hour. The Prime Minister then follows it up with another tweet in which he shares two photographs of himself and the Queen during his previous visits to the UK, sharing a personal anecdote as well. The Queen shared a special relationship with India. She visited the country three times during her reign, the first visit in 1961, 15 years after India's independence. The news of the Queen's demise will be dominating headlines as India wakes up. We've just seen the flags on the Sydney Harbour Bridge being lowered to half-mast as a mark of respect. Australians are waking up to the news that Queen Elizabeth II has died. She had a deep affection for this country. She came here 16 times during her reign. The first visit came in 1954. It was a marathon. She visited 57 towns and cities in 58 days. And for many people here, she became a beacon of service and dedication. Across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has paid tribute to an incredible woman, saying that New Zealanders were lucky to have been able to call her their queen. These are sentiments echoed not just here in Australia, but across the Commonwealth. Here at the European Commission, as at the European Parliament, flags are flying at half-mast, while over in Paris, the Eiffel Tower has been plunged into darkness as a sign of respect. It is hard to overstate the respect and the admiration so many Europeans have for the Queen. And if you look at news websites across the continent, La Reina, La Reine, Die Königin, news of her death is on the front page. Norway's public broadcaster even suspended normal programming just to run specials on the Queen. And of course, we've heard from leaders and heads of state as well. Germany's president said she was a woman who shaped a century, while France's Emmanuel Macron said she was a kind-hearted queen who left a lasting impression. Previously, he described her as the golden thread binding the UK and France since World War II. And through years of public service and family ties, the Queen had close relationship with Europe's royal families as well. And they've been touching unusually personal messages tonight. Spain's King Felipe used to address her as dear Aunt Lilibet. And tonight he said he would miss her dearly. Here in Belgium, the King and Queen said all of their encounters would now be etched on their memories forever. Rest in peace, Your Majesty, they said, alongside your beloved husband. Katia Adler there in Brussels, yes. Worth reflecting that, of course, um, both the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh uh, were connected to Queen Victoria and therefore connected to all the European royal families. So, of course, uh, there is a period of reflection in Europe at the moment and, and a historic connection uh, in many of those reflections as well. Uh, let's talk to Mark LaBelle, who's here with us. Um, talk to me, first of all, about the European newspapers, because they're just dropping. The Queen was an icon on the global stage, as we've been hearing. There was a void that she leaves. If we look at Le Figaro, uh, many of the front pages, uh, this one, a French newspaper, um, but others which we'll show you now from the Middle East uh, and on websites all around the world, this story dominating the news and the prominence that it's given mm -hmm. to the Queen, reflective of the value that she had in their hearts. Now, if we look at the UK newspapers, there are two photos that really dominate. Uh, but the style of the papers, well, it's black and white mastheads. They've kind of taken away the color. It's a respectful tone. It's often touching. If I show you the Express, this is our beloved queen is dead. They've used a portrait there released by the royal family at the time of death. We also find that in the Telegraph, which choose the words, grief is the price we pay for love. 
Um, and when we see the Telegraph, you'll see that uh, they're reflecting this theme of a nation in mourning, and they're using her words following the 9-11 attacks in New York. The Times, uh, there's the Telegraph, as you can see, in that same portrait. Also, if we go to the Times, where they just splash with death of a queen, mm. death of the queen. Um, I was just going to say, uh, sorry to interrupt you, I was just going to say that, uh, I mean, the, the death was announced at 6.30 uh, in the evening here in London, so that gave the, the papers plenty of time. The entirety of the newspapers, correct? It, uh, off, uh, it's full of history, it's full of the photographs, the, the reminiscing, um, and also a lot of talk about the character of the Queen. That's right. Uh, the character is shown in a t a many of the newspapers. Um, the Mirror is saying uh, thank you to the Queen. The Sun says we loved you, ma'am. Um, uh, there's a tribute from Charles on the back. I mean, the character is quite something, isn't it, Christian? You know, not just that she can cameo with Paddington and James Bond. Uh, I was setting up a bar in Buckingham Palace once. There was a staff party there. I was helping out and I could see this granny in a cardigan coming forwards and some dogs coming. I realised it was the corgis and the Queen. <laughs> and she fastidiously went through all the tables there checking that, t that the tables had been laid out properly, checking the knives and forks, setting, checking the place settings. You know, this is the woman that you crouch around the, the TV around Christmas to, to hear her message that then has an audience with prime ministers. And the resilience of this woman, you know, she had family troubles. Who doesn't? She had mobility issues and yet kept it going right to the end till she was 96. She is going to be a tough act to follow for King Charles III. Yeah, she had a fastidious eye. I remember watching a BBC documentary on, on occasions, on state dinners, she would go down the table checking the cutlery that it was in the right place uh, and making her alterations so that everything was, was just so. Uh, that was the nature of the Queen. And yet, I was saying to Cathy earlier, although there was a protocol, she was very good at putting people at ease. She had a natural charm. Everyone talked about her stillness in a world in flux. And I think she was charming and polite, but she was also direct. And sometimes through the newspapers, she would send a message, like dressing up in the Ukrainian flag colours at the time of, of, of that war, mm. when the war in the Ukraine began. So she had a way of getting her message across too. Inscrutable, but not always. <laughs> Mark LaBelle, thank you very much indeed. The Queen chose to spend the majority of her later years at Windsor Castle instead of her official residence of Buckingham Palace. Our special correspondent Fergal Keane has been gathering reaction from people in Windsor. The signal of an ending in the place so close to her heart and in whose heart she was beloved. We've just heard the news. What are you feeling? Well, it's just hit me. It really has, and I think it's going to hit everybody in this town, but not only here, all over the world. You know, she was a grandmother, she was a mum. She's part of my life, she's part of my mum's life, my late father's life, every, everybody. As the news filtered out across the town, there was comfort in gathering together to absorb, to reflect. It's very sad. I think everyone's just come to pay their respects because she's such an amazing woman. Um, it's just very sombre mood in Windsor, really. And what did she represent to people of your generation? A guiding light, a moral code, how to conduct yourself, how to act, you know, what's right and what's wrong. Here on the streets of Royal Windsor, the sense of an epoch having passed is palpable. There is the sense of mourning shared with the entire nation. But something else, for these people have lost a neighbour, a queen who was part of their daily lives. Amir Bukhari was getting calls from relatives in Pakistan who'd heard the news. He runs a cafe beside Windsor Castle. Uh, no words actually to express my emotions. It's really sad. What did she mean to you? Uh, she was really, really important. It's not only me, it's around the world. Everybody was feeling very sad, very down, very depressed. Yes, and for, her, for, her, for us, she was a neighbour, and we feel more. No matter how long anticipated, the end has crystallised loss. The passing of a monarch who symbolised to people the best of their nation, of themselves. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Windsor. Throughout her life, the Queen was guided by her own strong religious beliefs. Aline McBall looks back now at how those deeply held beliefs influenced her reign. 
head of state and supreme governor of the Church of England. It was clear from the start that for Her Majesty the Queen, faith was about much more than her constitutional role in an ever-changing Britain. It was a guide to the way she lived her life. The act which began with the invocation of the Holy Spirit. This is a most sacred part of the service, for it is the Queen's hallowing. At her coronation, itself a ceremony steeped in religious significance, the Queen promised to uphold both the laws of the nation and the Protestant religion. She embraced being defender of the faith in a way that showed it was much more than just an inherited title to her. For your servanthood is the glory of your reign. And today we thank God for it. She was also a vital ambassador for the Anglican Church abroad. And she met five popes, quite the turnaround for a monarchy that once split so spectacularly from Rome. At home, she left governance to the bishops, but as an ever-ready listener and guide to them. I know if I got into trouble, the queen would sit me out. The acts that she's performed in different contexts, spanning over 70 years, really couldn't have done that, it seems to me, if our relationship with Jesus Christ was not a joyful one. And every year in Christmas broadcasts, there were insights into the way the Queen's faith guided her. For me, the life of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, whose birth we celebrate today, is an inspiration and an anchor in my life. A role model of reconciliation and forgiveness, he stretched out his hands in love, acceptance and healing. Christ's example has taught me to seek to respect and value all people of whatever faith or none. In recent decades, she visited temples, synagogues, gurdwaras and mosques as the nation grew in diversity. She said Anglicanism had a duty to protect free practice of other religions too. She doesn't act like a politician. She has genuine care, genuine interest uh, and wants the best, certainly for our faith and for all faiths. But all guided by her own faith. The head of the Catholic Church in England and Wales remembers a national service at St Paul's Cathedral. At a certain point in the ceremony, we were all asked to recite a long prayer which was printed out in the order of service. And I looked up and the Queen had her eyes shut and she was reciting this prayer by heart. And I thought, there's a woman who prays, who probably prays every day. At least that's what I saw before my eyes. When they gathered for her Platinum Jubilee at St Paul's, they gave thanks for the Queen's reign, for her service and her faith. They commemorated the way she guided the church in a fast evolving world and her commitment to bring all people together. Yes, a life of, sight, of service of duty and all of it underpinned by her faith. Nicholas Witchell looks back now at the Queen's long life. No British monarch lived longer or reigned for a greater span of years. Few presided over a period of greater change and very few brought quite such a level of dedication to the role. Elizabeth was born on the 21st of April, 1926 the elder daughter of the then Duke of York. No one could have imagined then that she would one day be queen. But when she was 10 years old, her uncle, King Edward VIII, abandoned the throne and her father became King George VI. During the Second World War, as German bombs fell on Britain, the royal family, Princess Elizabeth as she was then, her younger sister Margaret, and their parents, the King and Queen, 
came to symbolize the nation's fight against tyranny. Elizabeth briefly joined up. She was taught how to drive and service an army lorry. On the night Britain celebrated victory in Europe, the crowds gathered outside Buckingham Palace and Elizabeth joined her family on the palace balcony. In anybody's life, engagement day is a red letter day. By now she was a young woman and she'd fallen in love. Her engagement to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten was announced in July 1947. Four months later, they were married in Westminster Abbey. A year later, their first child, Charles, was born. Two years after that, a daughter, Anne. But the king was in poor health. He'd been treated for lung cancer. When Elizabeth left for a visit to East Africa in February 1952, it was to be the last time she would see him. At the moment of her father's death from a heart attack, Elizabeth was in a game park in Kenya. She returned to London as queen. In a way, I didn't have an apprenticeship. My father died much too young. And so it was all a very sudden kind of taking on and making the best job you can. Elizabeth's coronation took place in June 1953, and for the first time, television cameras were allowed into Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to millions. The moment of the Queen's crowning is come. Elizabeth was sovereign and head of state, not just of the United Kingdom, but of Britain's realms and territories in every continent. The Queen is greeted by the Governor General. She was to become the most travelled monarch in British history. I want to tell you all how happy I am to be amongst you and how much I look forward to my journey through Australia. It's estimated that on that first visit to Australia, three quarters of the country's entire population turned out to see her. By the 1960s, social attitudes were changing. There was less deference. The monarchy was thought by some to be out of touch. The response, a groundbreaking television documentary. The film, Royal Family, showed the Queen working. Yes, ma'am. Oh, do you think you could bring up those papers that I was looking at yesterday? Oh. I fit on there. Take the and relaxing with her family. The salad is ready. Good. With this ring. With this ring. I thee wed. I thee wed. The 1980s began with a moment of great promise. The marriage of Prince Charles to the young Diana Spencer at St. Paul's Cathedral. By the early 90s, so much had turned to dust. Charles and Diana separated in 1992. The marriages of Princess Anne and Prince Andrew had already collapsed. And at the end of that year, the Queen watched as her favourite home, Windsor Castle, was seriously damaged by fire. Worse was to follow. In August 1997, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed in a car accident in Paris. The Queen had remained at Balmoral to care for William and Harry, but to grieving crowds outside Buckingham Palace, it seemed as though the royal family didn't care. The Queen returned to London, and in a live broadcast, she tried to heal the breach. What I say to you now, as your Queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. First, I want to pay tribute to Diana myself. The Commonwealth was a cause close to her heart. She visited most of its members. But it was a visit to Dublin in 2011 which was one of the most significant of her reign. She was the first British monarch to visit the Republic of Ireland. She spoke about Britain's regrets. We can all see things which we would wish had been done differently, or not at all. The following year, in Belfast, she met and shook hands with Martin McGuinness, a former leader of the IRA who by then was Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland. It was another significant gesture of reconciliation. 
A diamond jubilee in 2012 confirmed the nation's deep respect and affection for a monarch who'd reigned for 60 years. Mr. Bond, Your Majesty. It was also the year when the Queen showed that she too could spring a surprise. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Sovereign and secret agent, one of the highlights of the opening night of the London Olympics. She continued with her public duties well into her 90s. There was further family turmoil, though. Prince Andrew was forced to withdraw from public life amid claims he'd sexually assaulted a 17-year-old, claims he denied. And then the Sussexes, Harry and Meghan, decided that they wanted to step back from royal life. They moved to California and gave a television interview in which Meghan made damaging criticisms of the royal family. They were unsettling moments, presided over by a monarch who showed that her sense of commitment was undiminished. Together we are tackling this disease. During the coronavirus emergency of 2020, she broadcast a reassuring message to the nation. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. The death in April 2021 of her beloved husband, Philip, after 73 years of marriage, was a moment of deep sadness. It was born with the stoicism that she so often personified. There was never any question of her withdrawing from the path of duty. By the time of her platinum jubilee in 2022, it was apparent that her health was deteriorating. But there was still room for a surprise, a chaotic tea party with Paddington Bear. Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich? I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you for everything. That's very kind. This was a monarch at peace and enjoying herself. On the final day of the Jubilee celebrations, there was a final appearance on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. A much-loved monarch acknowledged the many thousands who'd waited to see her until, finally, it was time to go. There was an unspoken feeling that an era was drawing to a close. For decade after decade, Elizabeth II was the constant and reassuring presence at the centre of national life. Respected as a constitutional monarch, admired within Britain, the Commonwealth and beyond. It was a life sustained by faith and driven by duty, and by the pledge she'd made on her 21st birthday. I declare before you all that my whole life whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it.
Welcome to viewers in the UK, across the world and on PBS in America. I'm Christian Fraser with special coverage following the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in the history of the United Kingdom. The Queen died at the age of 96 at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. She was a commanding presence in British public life over a span of eight decades. Now, her eldest son, Charles, at the age of 73, has become King Charles III. It was at half past six on Thursday evening that Buckingham Palace released this formal statement. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. Following the death of his mother, His Majesty King Charles III released this statement. The death of my beloved mother, Her Majesty the Queen, is a moment of the greatest sadness for me and all members of my family. We mourn profoundly the passing of a cherished sovereign and a much-loved mother. I know her loss will be deeply felt throughout the country, the realms and the Commonwealth and by countless people around the world. During this period of mourning and change, my family and I will be comforted and sustained by our knowledge of the respect and deep affection in which the Queen was so widely held. The Queen had symbolised all that was constant and reassuring. And for the vast majority of people in Britain and the Commonwealth, the treasured and highly visible link with Britain's past has now gone. Our Royal Correspondent Daniela Ralph looks back on a momentous day. Tuesday the 6th of September, the last photographs of the Queen, 96 years old and still at work. Meeting the new Prime Minister at Balmoral, a duty she had been keen to fulfil, and one we now know was her final duty, after seven decades of public service. Around four o'clock this afternoon, a number of the Queen's family arrived at Aberdeen Airport. Her grandson, the Duke of Cambridge, was first to emerge, followed by her daughter-in-law, Sophie, the Countess of Wessex, and then her two youngest sons, Edward, the Earl of Wessex, and Andrew, the Duke of York. The Duke of Cambridge drove the family group to Balmoral to join his father and other members of the family already there with the Queen. Harry, the Duke of Sussex, arrived separately later in the evening. Here in the UK for a number of charity events, his wife Meghan did not accompany him to Scotland. At 6.30, Buckingham Palace officially announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Following tradition, the statement was attached to the palace gates by two footmen as tributes began. Queen Elizabeth II was the rock on which modern Britain was built. Our country has grown and flourished under her reign. She was the very spirit of Great Britain and that spirit will endure. She has been our longest ever reigning monarch. It's an extraordinary achievement to have presided with such dignity and grace for 70 years. And with the passing of the second Elizabethan age, we usher in a new era in the magnificent history of our great country, exactly as Her Majesty would have wished, by saying the words, God save the King. And also from the leader of the opposition. For the vast majority of us, the late Queen has been simply the Queen, the only Queen. Above all else, our Queen. As we mourn her loss, we should also treasure her life, our longest serving and greatest ever monarch. Above the clashes of politics, she stood not for what the nation fought over, but what it agreed upon. Throughout the day, there had been growing unease about the Queen's health. In the Commons, as Keir Starmer stood up to speak, Opposite him, the Prime Minister was being told of the Queen's condition. Information passed to Angela Rayner, Labour's deputy leader, who left her seat for a while to discuss the development before the Speaker of the House addressed the chamber. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best, best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. 
Cheered by onlookers, one of the Queen's last royal engagements was in July, with her daughter, Princess Anne, opening a new state-of-the-art hospice in Berkshire. But these kind of visits had become rare over the past year. As the Queen relied on her walking stick, her mobility compromised. The royal household had tried to adapt to keep her active and visible. A golf buggy at the Chelsea Flower Show helped keep the Queen comfortable. But she had become noticeably thinner and frailer, something that severely limited her involvement in her own Platinum Jubilee celebrations, with her family increasingly representing her. At the weekend, her son stood in at the Braemar Highland Games, always a favourite event for the Queen that she reluctantly missed. Like so much of her life, the decline in her health was played out in public. Duty may have got harder to manage physically, but mentally, even emotionally, the Queen remained engaged and working to the very end. Such a seismic moment, a moment that so many have dreaded for so long, and yet it has come. And when news of it came, there were thousands of people on the Mall who had come to see and to pay their respects outside Buckingham Palace, and they would have seen the official notice issued by the Royal Household being pinned to the railings of the palace. It is now just after two o'clock in the morning here, so understandably a little quieter. It is not a very pleasant night here in London. It has been raining, uh, but Kasha Madeira is there for us. And really a city that never sleeps. So people still passing the gates, uh, still taking their photographs, Kasia, and laying their flowers. Very much so, Christian, and people still continue to come. And the notice that you were speaking about, it's, it's really quite small, actually. It's, a, it's an A4-sized piece of paper in a wooden frame that's just behind me pinned to the palace walls. And it is the formal notice bearing the news that the Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon and it reads the King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow, tomorrow being, well, effectively now Friday. So that is the official message, the official posting that people are coming here to take pictures of, taking photos of and just gathering to pay their respects. And we've met so many different people who just feel that they want to be here with other people. And yes, like you were saying, it's the middle of the night and yet people still continue to come. The numbers have dropped at the height of the crowds. There were a couple of thousand people here, far fewer now, but they still come. And so why, why did you feel you wanted to be here? Um, so I'm from the Commonwealth, I'm from India, and I came here to study originally. Um, I'm, I was doing my degree in politics and international relations. So this is, as far as I could s imagine, probably one of the most significant moments in the history of this country. And I was like, I'm very lucky to be here. Um, the Queen was a significant part of the Commonwealth and I just wanted to come show my respects and um, just be here for the moment and see what London would be like in a, in a massive moment like this, I guess. It is a huge moment, thank you very much. And it's, it's, it's that, that huge moment, this historic moment and of course people just wanting to pay their respects. I wonder if some of anybody Hi. else who wants to that's Just okay. explain why you're here. It's the middle of the night in, the in of the London, night. and yet we're still gathering here. Yeah. I actually, here? I came home after a work event, and I turned on the TV, and I saw you. <laughs> and I thought, hold on a minute, something's happening here. So I came down to see this, be part of it. I'm sure I'm not the reason why not you came here. Not I mean, this, this event. Man, yeah. And, uh, and realising that people were here and... And you wanted to be here as well? Yeah, I did, yeah. Five minute walk, and here we are. A lot of diversity going on, which is good and interesting and, like, beautiful, really, isn't it? Thank you, thank you. So a lot of people here, and like I say, as you were saying, it's the middle of the night, yet people still continue to come, and flowers are being laid, tributes, the Union flag flying at half-mast, but lots of flowers and tributes, and mm -hmm. we expect far, far more people. The, 
infrastructure, the kind of city furniture is being brought in, lots of railings being brought in. We've got cherry pickers putting up the Union flag all around and the entrances to Pall Mall into Constitution Hill, the, the main arteries that lead up to Buckingham Palace are closed to the traffic but very much open to the public, to people on foot who want to come and they do continue to come. Now we know that the Queen will be lying in state for a number of days and it will be Buckingham Palace that will eventually bring, give us, announce the date of the funeral itself but right now at this moment in time a lot of people just wanting to be a part of this history and it's quiet and it's somber. There are some people singing a little bit earlier on today. People were spontaneously breaking into songs singing the national anthem but singing God Save the King. So just an indication of the change that this nation is coming to with people continuously coming to pay their respects in the middle of the night outside Buckingham Palace. Yes, as they will do at all the palaces, of course. Buckingham Palace uh, was seen by the Queen very much as the office. Uh, home was at Windsor. Um, of course, it is Sandringham and uh, um, Balmoral, the houses that she owned, where she loved to be, particularly at Balmoral. Um, and as the doctor said at the end, uh, she was comfortable and peaceful with her family around her. As we know, the Queen was not only the monarch for the United Kingdom, you've just seen it reflected there at the gates of Buckingham Palace, she was also the head of state across 14 other Commonwealth countries. So how has the news been received across the world? Our diplomatic, diplomatic correspondent James Landale has been looking at the international response. From the moment the Queen's reign began in Kenya in 1952, she played a constant and significant role on the international stage. And today there was an outpouring of sorrow and regret in every corner of the globe. As her 12th Canadian Prime Minister, I'm having trouble believing that my last sit down with her was my last. I will so miss those chats. She was thoughtful, wise, curious, helpful, funny, and so much more. She was one of my favorite people in the world, and I will miss her so. The President of France, Emmanuel Macron, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth embodied the continuity and unity of the British nation for over 70 years. I keep the memory of a friend of France, a Queen of Hearts, who marked her country and her century forever. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, said Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. And the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, said it is with deep sadness that we learned of the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. On behalf of the Ukrainian people, we extend sincere condolences to the royal family, the entire United Kingdom and the Commonwealth over this irreparable loss. The president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who met the Queen in more peaceful times, offered his condolences, saying she'd enjoyed the love and respect of her subjects and authority on the world stage. She was dubbed by one of her biographers as Queen of the World, visiting hundreds of countries throughout her reign. She was monarch of 15 separate realms, the head of a commonwealth of some 56 nations. So there was no surprise that news of the Queen's death made headlines around the world. Königin Elisabeth II is tot. Das teilte der Buckingham Palast in London mit. Tonight at the White House, the flags were at half-mast. Throughout her reign, the Queen was a living embodiment of the transatlantic relationship, meeting no fewer than 12 US presidents. I had the opportunity to meet her before she passed, and she was an incredibly gracious and decent woman. And the thoughts and prayers of the American people are with the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in their grief. Barack Obama said she had reigned with grace, elegance and a tireless work ethic. Views echoed on the streets of Washington. I admire her greatly. Yeah, I'm so sorry that she's passed. I mean, she's an icon 
here, everywhere. Horrible. I've been reading about her my whole life. She's one of the sane people in the UK, like the US, and that's just sad. As head of the Commonwealth throughout her reign, the Queen nurtured and shaped a unique international organization whose leaders, past and present, relied on her wisdom and judgment. The last days of the Queen's life captures who she was in so many ways, working till the very end on behalf of the people she loved. And that is why I'm sure that we will receive the news of her passing with both emotions of deep sadness but also gratitude for a life that was utterly and completely devoted to the service of others. And it was to a meeting of Commonwealth leaders that the Queen made her last overseas tour in 2015, visiting Malta, an island she'd once called home. The bookend of a life of duty and diplomacy on the international stage. James Landell, BBC News. As you would expect, there have been condolences sent from all around the world. At the United Nations, the Security Council held a minute's silence. Pope Francis praised Queen Elizabeth's steadfast faith and said he was praying for her eternal rest. The French leader, Emmanuel Macron, said he would remember the Queen as a friend of France. And in Germany, President Steinmeier said there are millions of Germans in mourning united with the people of the United Kingdom. In the United States, the flags over the White House and the Capitol building are at half-mast tonight. Let's go to Washington then and speak to our colleague, Kelly Kay, who is there for us. And I understand President Biden, Kelly, uh, paid a visit today to the British Embassy. The embassy to sign the book of condolences sat there with uh, Jill, his wife, um, and the British ambassador, Dame Karen Pierce, greeted them. Mm -hmm. And then they went in and they, they left their message for the Queen. And then, as you heard in James Landale's piece, he also mm -hmm. sent out a statement. I, a friend of mine, an American, has texted me just a few minutes ago and said, you know, it's amazing. The five most recent American presidents have all sent tributes to Queen Elizabeth it's probably the only thing that they agree on. And it's so rare, and maybe that was her, you know, her extraordinary power was her neutrality, that you could, every single one of those presidents will have met her and felt they had a private time with her, um, and that nothing they said to her was ever going to be leaked into the, out into the public domain, and that she made time to get to know each of them and spend time with each of them and make them feel welcome and at ease. Um, an American who worked with, uh, Bill Clinton was recently saying on television today that, you know, she had this amazing ability to make you feel relaxed, even though she was the queen, and to try and make an effort to put you at ease. And I just thought it was a funny observation that you've got all these presidents in this incredibly divided time in America, and yet what do they agree on? They agree that they really appreciated the queen. And the president recognised that. In his statement, he said she brought such dignity to the job, but also in an ever-shifting world, in a deeply political partisan world, she brought a sense of, of reassurance. And that is true of our country as much as it is of, of the United States. And, it, and it's that continuity, Catty, that will be missed. And, and deeply unsettling for the UK, who could ever have foreseen that the head of state and the prime minister would both change within 48 hours? I know. I was thinking that today. You know, we've had this tricky transition of power, as you know, here in the US. And yet I look across the Atlantic and I see there in Britain, you've had the prime minister change hands and the queen change hands as it should happen, uh, the monarchy totally peacefully um, and without any discord. And it is a sort of remarkable thing to have happened. It, the, the system is functioning exactly as it should function. And I'm speaking from a country where there are questions about whether the system is functioning. And I think that too is probably something that Americans are looking at what's happening in Britain and appreciating not just her, but the fact that the, the system and the monarchy is, is, it has become so stable under her 70 year reign. Kelly Kay in Washington, thank you very much indeed. Well, news of the Queen's death dominated headlines all over the world, from Commonwealth nations like India and Kenya to the United States. So let's hear from our team of international correspondents, starting with Anne Soy in Kenya, where then Princess Elizabeth first learned she was to become Queen. It was here in Sagana, central Kenya, that then Princess Elizabeth became Queen. She was on tour representing her ailing father when she received the news that he had sadly passed away. And it was a different time in history. 
country after country on the continent were gaining independence. And even though they chose republicanism, they understood hereditary monarchy. And therefore, wherever she traveled on the continent, they understood her place, they respected her. And she played a key role in bringing them into the Commonwealth. As head of Commonwealth, she kept the organization together and grew it. To this day, it continues to expand and messages of condolence have been coming in from across the continent from leaders, including monarchs. And they recognize and deeply admire her service to the Commonwealth and to the world. Well, the flag is flying at half staff here at the White House in honor of a reign that has seen the swearing in of 13 US presidents. The Queen met 12 of them personally, and the last of that long line, Joe Biden, has issued a statement saying that in his meetings with her, she charmed him and the First Lady with her wit and moved them with her kindness. In recent years, of course, like elsewhere in the world, news coverage of the British monarchy has often been driven by intrigue and scandal. But today, as the major networks roll on events in Balmoral, there is a real sense of a moment in history. The last King of America was Queen Elizabeth II's great, great, great grandfather. And her time on the throne has been marked by an even further shift away from those colonial ties and towards a relationship of two independent modern nations defined by their shared democratic values. News of the Queen's death is dominating headlines here in India. Prime Minister Narendra Modi put out this tweet saying, and I quote, her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II will be remembered as a stalwart of our times. She provided inspiring leadership to her nation and people. She personified dignity and decency in public life. Pained by her demise, my thoughts are with her family and people of the UK in this sad hour. The Prime Minister then follows it up with another tweet in which he shares two photographs of himself and the Queen during his previous visits to the UK, sharing a personal anecdote as well. The Queen shared a special relationship with India. She visited the country three times during her reign, the first visit in 1961, 15 years after India's independence. The news of the Queen's demise will be dominating headlines as India wakes up. We've just seen the flags on the Sydney Harbour Bridge being lowered to half-mast as a mark of respect. Australians are waking up to the news that Queen Elizabeth II has died. She had a deep affection for this country. She came here 16 times during her reign. The first visit came in 1954. It was a marathon. She visited 57 towns and cities in 58 days. And for many people here, she became a beacon of service and dedication. Across the Tasman Sea in New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has paid tribute to an incredible woman, saying that New Zealanders were lucky to have been able to call her their queen. These are sentiments echoed not just here in Australia, but across the Commonwealth. Here at the European Commission, as at the European Parliament, flags are flying at half-mast, while over in Paris, the Eiffel Tower has been plunged into darkness as a sign of respect. It is hard to overstate the respect and the admiration so many Europeans have for the Queen. And if you look at news websites across the continent, La Reina, La Reine, Die Königin, news of her death is on the front page. Norway's public broadcaster even suspended normal programming just to run specials on the Queen. And of course, we've heard from leaders and heads of state as well. Germany's president said she was a woman who shaped a century, while France's Emmanuel Macron said she was a kind-hearted queen who left a lasting impression. Previously, he described her as the golden thread binding the UK and France since World War II. And through years of public service and family ties, the Queen had close relationship with Europe's royal families as well. And there have been touching, unusually personal messages tonight. Spain's King Felipe used to address her as dear Aunt Lilibet, and tonight he said he would miss her dearly. Here in Belgium, the King and Queen said all of their encounters would now be etched on their memories forever. Rest in peace, Your Majesty, they said, alongside your beloved husband. She was the most travelled head of state of all time. 16 visits to Australia, 10 to New Zealand, 22 to Canada. 
and also to the family of nations she knew as the Commonwealth. We can now speak to journalist Sophie Ellsworth at The Australian. Welcome to the programme. How will The Australian be remembering the Queen's life and her reign? Well, there's certainly an outpouring of grief over here in Australia. We learned of the Queen's passing about 3.30 a.m. here in Melbourne, where I'm based. Uh, a lot of Australians uh, have only just... Uh, understood what has unfolded in recent hours, given this happened in the middle of the night. But it's absolutely uh, devastating to learn the news here in Australia, obviously with our close ties uh, with the British monarchy and the Commonwealth. Uh, we have flags half-mast all across the country, including on the Sydney Harbour Bridge at our Australian Parliament in Canberra. And, uh, you know, the Prime Minister here, Anthony Albanese, and the Governor-General, David Hurley, will travel to London le next week to meet with the King uh, following the news of the Queen's passing here. Tell me about how the, the news was shared, because uh, it was at 6.30 in the evening here in, in the UK, but obviously news of the Queen's condition, that would have come in Australia in the, the, the early hours of the morning, correct? That's right. And a lot of the newspapers here today uh, that were published overnight had that there were grave concerns for the Queen's health. Uh, but obviously uh, that changed overnight when she passed away. Uh, so there's a lot of digital newspapers uh, printing digital editions this morning, uh, remembering the Queen's wonderful life. And also the news outlets obviously came in to work very early, three or four in the morning. Uh, to discuss this breaking news. But there's obviously uh, a deep sense of grief swept across Australia right now and everyone's, like around the world, trying to come to terms with this news of such a huge loss, not only to the Commonwealth, but to the world. And Sophie, obviously there is a debate in Australia and it's been reopened by the President about the constitutional monarchy and, and, and whether Australia should go a different way. Do you think at a period of such national grief and, 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 and reflection, is there a, a possibility, in fact, that the royal family becomes more popular at this time? Well, I think obviously now is not really the time for that discussion, given so many people are in grief at the moment. But it's definitely been an issue that's been raised many times uh, and remains an issue in Australia. But in saying that, there's huge support uh, for the monarchy. And uh, there was a referendum several decades ago that failed to become a republic. Uh, you know, there's a, a very strong support for the monarchy to continue and Australia's ties to the Commonwealth to remain. So no doubt this will be discussed in coming months and years, but uh, there is a huge support uh, for the royal family and the monarchy here in Australia. Uh, we've been saying through the night that th there's going to be such an enormous period of adjustment here in the UK. She is everywhere. She's on our post boxes. She's on our stamps and our coins. She, her face hangs in every government building. And I, I imagine to a large extent it's the same in Australia. She is the head of state. Do you think Australians are ready for that adjustment? Well, that's right. She's everywhere here too. I mean, she's on all our currency uh, that will obviously change in due course. Uh, you know, there's deep affiliation with the monarchy and the Commonwealth here in Australia, and a lot of Australians are incredibly pow uh, uh, proud of the ties. Uh, but, you know, there's immense loss here in Australia, across the country, whether you're a Republican or a monarchist, uh, people are feeling this from all walks of life here in Australia. She was here 16 times. She was the only monarch to ever visit Australia and her last trip was in 2011 when the streets across Australia were lined 30 deep with Australians rushing to get a glimpse of the Queen and I myself travelled to London recently for the Queen's Jubilee. Uh, those celebrations were, you know, so, I was so lucky to be a part of them. Uh, you know, this is a woman that will never be replaced, she is irreplaceable and uh, a lot of deep sense of grief here in Australia. Sophie Ellsworth, uh, thank you very much for your reflections. Thank you. Well, the Queen chose to spend the majority of her later years at Windsor Castle instead of her official residence of Buckingham Palace. Our special correspondent, Fergal Keane, has been gathering reaction 
from people in Windsor. The signal of an ending in the place so close to her heart and in whose heart she was beloved. We've just heard the news. What are you feeling? Wow, it's just hit me. It really has, and I think it's going to hit everybody in this town, but not only here, all over the world. You know, she was a grandmother, she was a mum. She's part of my life, she's part of my mum's life, my late father's life, every, everybody. As the news filtered out across the town, there was comfort in gathering together to absorb, to reflect. It's very sad. I think everyone's just come to pay their respects because she's such an amazing woman. Um, it's just very sombre mood in Windsor, really. And what did she represent to people of your generation? A guiding light, a moral code, how to conduct yourself, how to act, you know, what's right and what's wrong. Here on the streets of Royal Windsor, the sense of an epoch having passed is palpable. There is the sense of mourning shared with the entire nation. But something else, for these people have lost a neighbour, a queen who was part of their daily lives. Amir Bukhari was getting calls from relatives in Pakistan who'd heard the news. He runs a cafe beside Windsor Castle. Uh, no words actually to express my emotions. It's really sad. What did she mean to you? Uh, she was really, really important. It's not only me, it's around the world. Everybody was feeling very sad, very down, very depressed. Yes, and for, her, for, her, for us, she was a neighbour, and we feel more. No matter how long anticipated, the end has crystallised loss. The passing of a monarch who symbolised to people the best of their nation, of themselves. Fergal Keane, BBC News, Windsor.